Hello, hello, hello. My name is Jill Osborne. I am the president and founder of the Interstitial Cystitis Network. It is Sunday, March 3rd, and it is time for a regularly scheduled IC support group meeting. Now, my purpose in doing this meeting is to make you so strong, so educated, so informed that no one can mess with you. Nobody can tell you that IC is all in your head or that your pelvic pain is all in your head. My goal is to give you knowledge, to give you really good questions to ask your doctors, to help you work with family members and friends. I want you to have a happy life. I want you to get relief. I want you to get the best medical care that you can possibly get. And so the purpose of this meeting is to give you some of that knowledge so that you can go back and kick butt in your life, <laughs> right? Because that's exactly what we want. Hi, Sherry, it's nice to see you. I was a little slow this morning. I had to help a neighbor. I had a neighbor that was moving and she needed to help moving some stuff. So I apologize for being just a wee bit late. Okay. So we um, normally do these meetings in three sections. We're gonna do some educational information first. A little wee little lecture. And we're gonna take questions for about two hours and then uh, we're gonna do a freebie. Alrighty, so let's just wait a couple minutes, let some people come in, and let me get my act together here. It's always hard when you lose neighbors. I love my neighbors, but unfortunately, they're getting a divorce and they had to sell their house, darn it. I want to take a moment and thank our sponsor for this event, and that is Preleaf also known as DSC Healthcare Solutions. The longest using supplement that has that has been available for IC patients is in DAC Preleaf. Preleaf is an acid, acid reducer. If you have a bladder wall injury and you know that if you pour acid on that injury, it's gonna hurt. Just like if you pour acid on a wound on your hand, it's going to hurt. And so the purpose of Preleaf is to give you something that can reduce the acid of any foods that you might be eating that could irritate you. Alrighty, so if you haven't tried Preleaf, give it a shot. You can find it on the IC Network website. You can find it on their website. I also write blogs for them on occasion because I've been working with this company for 25 years. Alrighty now, I wanna, I wanna talk a little bit about a patient that I was working with on Friday. And it was one of those patients that was driving me, made me really sad. Um, and, and you're going to, you're going to know in a reason, uh, in a moment why I'm so frustrated on his behalf. So hello everybody for coming in. Hi, Sharon. Hi, Karen. Hi, Ravonda. Nice to see you. Hello, YouTube. So if I'm looking up, I'm looking at Facebook. If I'm looking down, I'm looking at YouTube. Let me get my my YouTube section. Hey, for anybody in YouTube, if you guys could say something in chat, that would be really great. So I can make sure I can see it. Hi, Donna. Donna, 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 Donna. Right. Okay. So who won the, uh, in our last meeting, we had somebody win uh, the IC Chef Cookbook and that was Kathy Vaden. Kathy, if you're watching, you never sent me your address and I would love to send this book to you. Ready? So you won this uh, last week, and I would love to send this to you. Alrighty. Okay. So I want to tell you about a, a wonderful gentleman that I was working with on Friday. So he's 75 years old. He's had symptoms for uh, since he was in his early 40s. He's had 10 surgeries. He's flown across the country to see many, many doctors, and um. He is still in pain today. And not only is he in pain, he is exhausted in pain. His pain level has been high for some time. And so he called because he wanted to get some information and he wanted me to send him some stuff. Actually, what did he want? He wanted, what did he want? He called for kind of a, an unusual reason. And uh, before I could really answer his question, I needed to know a little bit more about him, got a little bit of history. And yeah, okay, so here's, you've got this wonderful man. 75 years old, had had pain for uh, decades, flown across the country, no relief. Supposedly he had tried everything and nothing had worked. And he was at the point of giving up, right? He just said, I can't do it anymore. I don't want to see any more doctors. I just, this is it. This is the way my life is going to be. And really the last time he had worked with a really good doctor was probably a decade ago. And I will tell you that 
10 years ago, there was very little hope. 10 years ago, we didn't, we didn't even have the AUA guidelines for the diagnosis and treatment of IC. We had so little 10 years ago. All we had was Elmeron. All we had was DMSO. And I tried to say to him, now listen, we've learned so much. We now know why patients go are in pain for a long period of time. We know why. I would love to get you back to a doctor who can do a proper diagnostic assessment workup on you. And he was just like, oh, I can't do it. I can't do it. I'm tired. I don't want to do it anymore. And so I had him tell me a little bit about his case, right? And it's like, okay, well, what, what were the treatments that you've done? Of which he could tell me virtually none. He, he didn't know the names of any of his treatments. And seriously, people, do not ever, ever, ever do that. We have on our website, in our free download area, medical records kit where you can track your medicine. You never, ever, ever let anyone put anything in your bladder unless they tell you what it is so that you do your due diligence so that we know what treatment it is. And in his case, he kept basically no records. So we didn't know what he had taken and what he had done, even his surgeries, although we did know I did, he was able to say that he had had a TERP. Um, so, you know, just as like one of those questions where I'm like, trying to pull this information out of them. Okay, do you remember what they did then? Do you remember what they did then? Okay, how did you feel afterwards? Yada, 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 yada. Just trying to mine this information for this, uh, for this wonderful man. And I said, okay, did you, have you ever had a hydrogestension? He goes, yeah. And I said, what did they see? What did they see? He said, my bladder was covered with ulcers. It was like, ah, light bulb. <laughs> it's like, Okay, now I got something to work with. And I said, now listen, this is good news. Did they treat them? He was like, I don't know. I said, no, 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 no. Come on now, no, no. Come on now. We're not, I'm not talking about Elmeron. I'm not talking about DMSO. I'm not talking about a bladder installation. Did they ever cauterize them? Did they fulgurate them? Or did they inject them with a steroid? He said, no, they never did anything. It's like, are you kidding me? Are you kidding me? The, the dominant, most well, actually the most common cause of patients with unremitting pain is untreated Hunter's lesions. A Hunter's, here's a picture. You want to see a picture of a Hunter's lesion? Here you go. Hunter's lesions. Hunter's lesions are known for what we call a stellate appearance. So look at this one. Look at this one right here. So there's a center wound, right? And then there are arms that go off, really profound inflammation. And as you look at this, you can see that this is a wound. You can see that this is bleeding, right? Hunter's lesions are, char are characterized by what we call a waterfall-like effect. That when you go in and, and stretch the bladder even a little tiny bit to look at the bladder more closely, Bam, you got massive bleeding out of these lesions. This poor gentleman, 25 years ago, was diagnosed with hundreds of lesions that have never been treated. Never been treated. And that is why he is indeed in pain today. And I just, oh my God, I can't tell you how angry that makes me because he has suffered. Now, I want to tell you, okay, so there are a couple of things I want to say about Hunter's lesions. Number one, about 10% of IC patients have them. Number two, it is a very distinct subtype. You know, hold on a second, my, light's, my light in here is a little bit weird. Oh, that's a little better. Um, it's, uh, it, you know, when we talk about the variety in the IC patient uh, population, there's one group that everybody in the world agrees on, and that is Hunter's lesion patients are different from everyone else. And the reason why is when we biopsy, biopsy that tissue, we find a massive amount of inflammation. All the rest of us, myself included, when we biopsy your bladder, we don't see inflammation to any great degree. Whereas in the Hunter's lesion patient, there is massive, massive inflammation, as you can see that. So the theory, there are a couple of theories behind Hunter's lesions. The theory number one is that it is a nerve kind of stuck 
Sorry, I'm trying to get this lighting right. Is that better? Okay, maybe kind of, sort of, okay. Um, the theory number one is that it is a nerve that is stuck in the on position. Here, hold on a sec. This light's driving me crazy. Try talking with a light staring at you in your face and it's not fun. Let me see if I can dim this a little bit. Hold on. Ah. Okay. Maybe I've got it. <laughs> hey, man, I know bladders. Uh, I can talk about bladders any day. Oh, okay. Hopefully that will do it. <laughs> okay. So theory number one on hunter's lesions is that there is a, uh, a nerve that is massively inflamed. And when a nerve is inflamed, it releases a substance called substance P. And substance P is incredibly irritating to those tissues. And substance P does tissue damage. So theory number one is that behind these wounds is massive neuroinflammation. Theory number two is that there is a virus living on the nerve and that this is in fact a viral infection. And we have a couple of research studies which have found viruses only in the urine of patients with lesions, specifically the polyoma BK virus, which was found in Europe. Uh, I think it was like in Austria or Switzerland. Uh, one of their researchers found that four or five years ago. And the, interestingly, the polyoma BK virus is a virus we all have. The polyoma BK virus is absolutely a virus that is part of the human biome. It is normally silent. It only gets turned on in patients who are immune compromised. And when it gets turned on, it is associated with hemorrhagic cystitis, bleeding cystitis. And you'll find many, many research studies that talk about polyoma BK calling, causing bleeding. So it could be a viral infection from polyoma BK, or last spring, we had our first research study that found Epstein-Barr, also known as mono, in, the, in patients with lesions, okay? So how do we treat these? How do we treat these? Well, Elmer isn't gonna do a damn thing. DMSO is not gonna do a damn thing. What's gonna treat this is if you inject it with a steroid, if you inject it with a steroid to calm the inflammation, triamcinolone, or you can cauterize it and kill the nerve. So imagine this man who has been suffering for decades with this and it's never been treated. And I know some of you watching this are exactly the same way. You know, it's a real sad when doctors find lesions and they don't do anything about it. And that's a very, very important question. You have got to ask your doctor when you have a, a hydrodistension. And that is, if they find anything, are they planning on treating it? Because it is a tremendous wasted opportunity if they don't, because you would have to have another hydrodistension to treat it correctly. Now, let me tell you a funny story. I'm gonna tell you a really interesting, funny story about this. Um, uh, the American Urology Association is the largest urology association in the world. And we are very grateful for them because they do a lot of IC research uh, uh, and they provide a, I mean, they provide a forum for the discussion of IC research at their annual meeting every year. And they have classes uh, that are wonderful. I've taken them. They have the equivalent of a science fair. They've got poster sessions where young researchers and older researchers can come present their knowledge on IC. That's how the mono study was released uh, last spring. So a couple years ago, this is so interesting. They accepted a paper from a guy in Europe to who said that the only way to treat a lesion was with Botox. Now, Understand that AUA offers teaching moments. So they gave him a spot to create a teaching moment. So here he is this young, really nice guy. I mean, I talked with him, nice guy. He absolutely believed that Botox should be used to treat lesions. So they give him an opportunity to speak to the assembly which is a group of, you know, maybe two or 300 of the best IC doctors in the world where he presents his paper, right? 
And in his paper, he notes that patients don't feel better after Botox therapy at all, at all. And so the number one doctor in Europe, Dr. Nordling, got up uh, to the microphone afterwards and just schooled him like you've never been schooled before. And in the end, what he said is, have you ever injected a lesion with a, with a, a steroid? And the guy was like, no. Have you ever lasered or fulgurated or cauterized a lesion? The guy goes, no. And he goes, well, that's really too bad because when I do it, the pain goes away in about 90% of my patients. But based upon your theory, your patient should have Botox, but be in pain afterwards. Whereas if we use a real lesion therapies, I can get these patients pain free. And this poor guy had just, you know, his, he, he, you know, deer in the headlights. And he just, kind of, I mean, it was an, a very impressive teaching moment. Uh, and, and, and that's important. We, we have to, you know, gosh, what was it? I mean, we see all sorts of crazy, weird theories that come 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 along every now and then. And, you know, they do their work, they present it, and bam, they're either going to get support or they're going to get schooled and explained why their approach does not make sense given the situation. Okay. So um, getting back to the 75-year-old man and literally what the American Urology Association says in their guidelines for IC is if your pain is increasing, if you are not responding to therapy, it is time to revisit the diagnosis. Let's make sure we haven't missed anything. We haven't missed anything. And in his case, here's what we know. They missed treating the lesions. And I'm, I have to write a, a, a I'm going to write a big long letter for him because he doesn't have access to the internet uh, about why he needs to have this done. And hopefully we can get this nice, lovely man out of pain. All righty. So that's my teaching moment for the night. And that is if you are not getting better, it is time to take a step back and let's make sure we haven't missed anything. Now, luckily, we have subtypes, right? So we now know, oh God, yeah, and I was, man, I'm, I'm a little frustrated with Twitter right now. Um, well, in general, social networking. Um, you know, we there are always strong interest groups. So you've got the people who believe that IC is infection. You got the people who believe that IC is, pro, is SIBO. You got the people who believe that IC is an incurable gen genetic disorder. You got the people who believe that it's pelvic floor. And as I said on my Twitter account yesterday, seriously, you cannot you cannot uh, paint broad strokes over this patient community. There are clear and distinct subtypes. So what works for one does not work for the other. And when that's and and that's let's see, that's exactly the direction we have to go as patients. If you're not getting better maybe you're not treating your right subtype. So let's review these subtypes really quickly because as I say to patients, you are an anatomical mystery to be solved. Hi, Lee. Hi, Catherine. Hello, Lou from the UK. Very nice to see you. Hi, Corrine from Belgium. Very nice to see you too. Hi, Faith. Evelyn says, can Kegel exercises make symptoms worse? Absolutely. If you got IC subtype three pelvic floor driven, you're gonna be worse. You shouldn't be doing kegels if you've got tight muscles. Let's go over these subtypes real quick, okay? So uh, in Europe, there are 12 different... Well, okay, let me just do my normal orientation. If you go into any support group meeting, you very quickly see the diversity in the IC patient population. You've got some patients whose bladders look like this. You've got other patients whose bladders are to totally normal, both diagnosed with IC, yet clearly they're not the same. You've got some patients with terrible pain, others with no pain, both diagnosed with IC, yet clearly they're not the same, okay? And when you get in and you start asking patients, when did your symptoms begin? That's when you see the diversity. That's when you see the diversity. Because for some people, IC begins at childhood. For others, IC begins when they're elderly. For some, IC begins after they have a baby. For others, IC begins after they fall and hit their tailbone. For some, IC begins after chemotherapy. For others, IC begins after a chronic infection. Okay? 
So clearly, clearly there is tremendous diversity in the IC patient population. And that is why Elmeron doesn't work for everyone. That is why DMSO didn't work for everyone. We can no longer paint these very broad strokes about IC anymore. So what doctors are doing around the world is something called subtyping. We're trying to figure out what is the right variant for you so that we can point you to the correct treatment for you. And um, somebody in uh, on Facebook is um, speaking, I think, Italian, and I do not speak Italian, so I apologize for that. Alrighty. So in Europe, we've got 12 variants of IC. In Canada, we have six variants of IC. In the United States, we do not have an agreed upon subtyping or phenotyping system. However, I use a system that was created by Dr. Christopher Payne. Uh, he ran the IC research program at Stanford University for 25 years. He's now in private practice at Vista Urology in San Jose, California. So if you're on the West Coast and struggling, he would be a very good resource for you if you want a second opinion. So when he proposed his subtyping system, he introduced it in a really provocative way because he basically said, we need to treat IC patients like cancer patients. And in my brain, I'm going, what? Why are you even talking about cancer? Let's not scare patients. And there's no connection between IC and cancer. And he said, you're right, there is no connection. However, when someone is diagnosed with cancer, they're given a very specific diagnosis. Cancer of the left breast that is estrogen dependent, type one, two, three. He said, and when you're given that diagnosis, there is a very clear treatment pathway, a very intuitive, clear treatment pathway, like with me two years ago with complex endometrial hyperplasia with atypia and a vague architectural complex, which meant I had to have a hysterectomy, which I did have because it was the start of uterine cancer. So he argues that when someone's diagnosed with cancer, they're given a very, very specific diagnosis and they absolutely know what to do next. And he says correctly, when somebody is diagnosed with IC, you don't know what to do next. There's no logical intuitive pathway. There's, you're just really be, between that small practice, local urologist who might only know of Elmeron, uh, they don't have a clue. You don't have a clue. And so he said, how do we give you that intuitive pathway? And the answer is with specificity. So he proposed five variants of IC. And in his system, there are subvariants. There are sub-subtypes. Um, and there's pr probably, I'm going to say in about five years or so, we're probably going to have 20 subtypes. I really think so. Um, but right now, we're working with five variants, OK? Subtype number one, Hunter's lesions, 100% 100 sure. There is no doubt that this is a distinct group of patients, as I mentioned earlier. So if you have Hunter's lesions, you need to be doing Hunter's lesion specific therapies. You can read about that on our website at the IC Network if you're not familiar with that before. And of course, you need to be following the IC diet. Because hello, if you pour acid on a wound, it's going to hurt like hell. And that's what happens. Patients with the most extreme diet sensitivities are patients with Hunter's lesions. In some cases, they're down to eating, I'm going to say, five foods for the really severe patient. I see subtype two, bladder wall injury. Bladder wall injury or bladder wall driven. Because hello, the bladder, like any other part of your body, can be hurt. Yeah, you can't see it, but it can still be hurt. So how does it get hurt? Number one, through chemical exposure. If you have chemotherapy, that's well known to damage the bladder wall. There are medications that damage the bladder wall. There are chemicals in our environment that can damage the bladder wall. And something like diet soda, if you're a big diet soda drinker, soda drinker, coffee drinker, tea drinker, that has the potential of damaging the bladder wall. We know your bladder wall is driving your symptoms if you have pain as your bladder fills with urine that is relieved by urination. So the fuller you get, the worse you feel, and as soon as you, as soon as you pee, there's a sense of relief. Might only last a couple minutes, but there's a profound sense of relief. That tells me that your bladder wall is driving your symptoms. Now, inside this subset, I mean, inside, in, in, inside this subtype, we have subsets. 
We have menopause-driven cancer, uh, menopause-driven estrogen atrophy, which can make the bladder more sensitive and vulnerable. We have chronic infection. We have fungal infection. We have um, other hormonal influences. There could be other hormones going on. So this is a group of patients who also have to follow the diet, but you're going to be doing therapies that are going to be focused on calming and soothing your bladder wall. A, the, a protective coating, if you like, like Elmeron, although we know that there are problems with Elmeron, um, or Sister Protec or Sister Renew. You're also probably going to be doing a bit of an antihistamine and a low dose antidepressant, not for depression, but to help calm and soothe the nerves in the bladder wall. Okay. And I'm going through this quickly and we'll come back and take questions if you have them. I see subtype three, pelvic floor driven. So these are the patients whose symptoms begin after a muscle trauma, a car accident, a fall, a rape, a history of athletics, a history of falling all the time, having a baby, okay? When, these, when the pelvic floor muscles in your pelvis are injured, they get weak. And when they get weak, they cannot do the job they're supposed to do, so they get tight. And when they get tight, they start influencing and impacting blood flow and nerve function. So for these patients, they're for, they have no freaking clue that they've got a muscle injury. Their first symptom is um, frequency urgency. And, and, and I'm sorry, I'm just seeing posts here too. I'm seeing posts here too. I'm going to come back to that post in a minute from Donna, but let me just finish what I'm saying here first. So you've got a pelvic floor injury. You have no clue until you have frequency urgency. And then you go to the doctor and they go, oh, it must be infection. They give you antibiotics. They don't work. Go back to the doctor. Oh, it must be overactive bladder, prostatitis. They give you those meds. They don't work. Then you go back to the doctor and the doctor goes, maybe you've got IC. Those don't work and you're sitting there suffering, often with a burning sensation, often with pain after you pee rather than bo before you pee. That is because fundamentally underneath those symptoms, you've got tight muscles that are impacting blood flow. So our ther therapeutic priority for somebody with IC subtype three is to restore blood flow through pelvic floor therapy. When we get those muscles to relax, blood flow increases, the bladder has an opportunity to heal. And of all the therapies out there, pelvic floor physical therapy is one of the most success successful at reducing the symptoms of IC. I see subtype four, pudendal neuralgia. So these are the patients with muscles so tight, they're squeezing nerves. And then I see subtype five, oops, I see subtype five is central sensitization. This is my subtype because it's inherited in my family. It goes back generations in my family. And this means that we are born with a more sensitive nervous system, or we have a sensitive, a, a nervous system that has been injured in some way. And thus we have very sensitive skin. We have a sensitive stomach. We have a sensitive bell. We are chemically sensitive. We have a wicked sense of smell. And in fact, I found another gas leak this week. They couldn't believe it. So those are our subtypes. I need to stop for a moment and I need to address Donna in Facebook. Donna is in the, in the hospital right now because she has pudendal neuralgia and she is having terrible, terrible pain and that she's struggling. Now, Donna, hun, first of all, if I could be there and I just, I want you to close your eyes and imagine that I'm sitting right next to you holding your hand, hun. Just close your eyes and just pretend that I'm sitting there. Okay, I really, really need you to do that right now. And take a deep breath in, out. Do it again, in, out. Okay, now Donna, listen. I'm glad you're in the hospital right now. This is good because you deserve the best care available. But what I want you to do is I want you to focus your doctor's attention on why your nerves 
are hurting. You are a pudendal neuralgia patient. You are not a typical bladder injury patient. Why? That's what we got to figure out is why are your nerves compromised? And they are in all likely compromised because last year you sustained a pelvic floor injury. Now, Donna, I mean, you guys, for those of you watching, Donna has been in, in many of our life support groups, so I'm not violating any confidentiality here. She's She shared her story and she is definitely in a very, very extreme situation. So Donna, when you're, when you're, when the doctors and the nurses come in, but specifically the doctor, I want you to ask the doctor to see if they can get a physical medicine specialist in, an orthopedic surgeon in, an orthopedist in to look at your pelvis because there has to be a reason why that nerve isn't trapped. You did not have this a year ago. It happened last spring, right? So we've got to figure out what happened last spring that caused nerves on both sides of your pelvis to become entrapped. And so I, I, I know that it's so hard to be your own advocate when you're crying your eyes out because the pain is so bad. That's when, again, take a deep breath and say, say to them, help me understand why this has happened. What caused these nerves to be entrapped? Where are they entrapped? Can we surgically release that? Can we do anything? And if they don't know, ask them to bring in a specialist. Ask them to consult with a specialist. You've got Robert Eckenberg, who is the nation's top doctor in pelvic pain, very, very nearby. Maybe there's a chance they can consult with him. Okay, hon, don't give up. There's no shame, no blame. I don't want you feeling guilty. I don't want you to feel like it's your fault. It is certainly not all in your head, my dear. You're in the best place you can possibly be, which is a hospital. Now let's get them to find a specialist to help you. Okay, hon? Big, 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 giant hug for you. I'm so, so sorry, but I believe healing is possible. All right. Glena says, can hunters ulcers heal on their own? I had that at 17, but at 27, they did a check and your bladder looked healed. Yeah, they can. Um, they Hunters lesion. Well, the first thing that I would want, want to know, Glena, is did the same doctor do the exam, do the hydro distension? Because we know that that doctors have varying skills with respect to identifying a lesion. Some are really good at it. Some are really bad at it. So if the first doctor found them, uh, found them and the second doctor maybe just really didn't know how to identify them correctly or couldn't really necessarily see them, uh, that could explain why they might say you, not, you might not have them. The, but the point, though, is that you're having bladder spasms and you're having pain anyway. And so... You either still have lesions or you've got bladder wall driven symptoms. And so you are again in IC subtype two. So what do we do? Number one, diet modification. Number two, drink plenty of water. We gotta, we've got to, you know, it is a natural instinct to patients to stop drinking water. Why? Because you don't want to pee. Uh, you know, you want to try to control your frequency. The problem with doing that is you're concentrating your urine and you're making your urine more acidic. And that is a problem. We have to keep that urine fairly dilute. So it's important that you, you increase your water to intake rather than decrease your water intake. Uh, the concept of a coating makes sense, especially if you're of age. If you are menopausal or you had a hysterectomy, then we know you don't have a lot of mucus in your bladder to protect your bladder. So using a topical estrogen product, uh, product might be important. In the same sense, you can also use a, um, a a medication that might provide you a little bit of an extra coating. I'd get my handy dandy slide. So if we explain this here, here's a three dimensional picture of your bladder. You've got mucus. You've got uh, four to five layers of urothelial cells, and underneath that, you've got nerves and blood vessels. This mucus acts as a protective coating. It is a barrier between what is in your urine and these cells. 
Unfortunately, this, this mucus is estrogen dependent. So when you're young, when you're young and you have lots of estrogen, you have lots of mucus. When you're older, you have much less estrogen, therefore you have much less mucus. And so using a topical estrogen product, especially at your urethra, because it's often the urethra, the first part of your body, the first part of your urinary tract that reacts, uh, or, and using it vaginally so that it can cross to the bladder can be really, really helpful. All righty. Um, antihistamine, uh, low-dose antidepressant. Um, we have the six-step treatment protocol for IC. You would work your way up that treatment protocol until we find that treatment that works for you. Most people do find that re find relief in step one and step two. Some have to go to step three, step four, step five. Thank you for saying the lighting works. It's just, you know, it's a rainy day here and my office is really muggy. And so my hair is being all weird. If, I, if my hair is going like that, it's just as muggy because it's really, it's really, uh, it's really wet here. Uh, JP Pirtle says she tried eight ounces of water with two tablespoons of apple cider vinegar with mother and two tablespoons of 100% honey twice a day for two weeks and then once a day. And it has helped. You know, hun, um, I, I, I don't really like that very much. Um, uh, what you're doing is you're alkalinizing your urine. That's what Prelief also does. But depending upon if you're IC subtype one hunters lesions, that would be very hard to do because those lesions are really susceptible and, and sensitive to those changes in pH. There are some foods out there that are really strongly acidic when you eat them. And by the time they arrive in your bladder, they're really alkaline. And citrus is one of those. So even though we say avoid, you know, the low, the low acid foods, you know, some people say, yeah, but citrus turns alkaline. And it's like, yeah, it does. But we don't have to explain that to everybody. It's the same thing. pH extremes are bad, whether it's acid or alkaline. So the whole apple cider vinegar thing, I would be pretty cautious with for, for many people. See how you feel. I, it's not something that, that I'm, a, I'm a fan of at all. Lori Johnson, talk about ways to stop urethral pain. All right. So urethral pain there are seven causes, seven known causes to urethral pain. I have a really good blog on our website about it. And for those of you who don't know our website, let me, you can come over to ic-network.com. We are the largest IC support group in the world, rated number one in the world in two peer-reviewed medical studies, Harvard Medical School and the University of London in England. Yes, yes, yes. And I moderate all that information. So um, let me pull up that blog real quick and let's just go over the, the, the top causes of urethral inflammation. So hold on a sec. Give me a quick moment. So I've gone over to the website. I wish I could screen share, but I can't. Here it is. And I just searched for urethra. All right. These seven causes for urethral pain are number one, obviously being catheterized. Uh, whenever you're catheterized, you certainly want to make sure that they're using what we call a low frick catheter. That is a catheter that is slick. It's, it's coated with moisture. So it's easy to slide in and it's easy to pull out. The whole old rubber tube catheters we do not do anymore. Number two, bladder infection. That's one differentiation between IC and UTI is uh, the urethra often screams when you have a bladder infection, but the urethra also often screams if you are if you have estrogen atrophy. And so if you are of an age where your skin is starting to get dry, then normally what they would do is they would give you an estrogen cream and they would have you put a pea sized drop right at the entrance to your urethra. So when that happened to me when I was 51, I had a lot of urethral irritation. I threw everything I knew in the book at it. Three months later, I gave up, went to my urologist, put me up on this in the stirrups. He took one look and he, and he groaned and he goes, Jill. And I'm like, what, what, what I do, what I do? He goes, didn't you use the hormone cream I uh, prescribed for you last year? And I went, no. Didn't think I needed it yet because in my brain, I'm 25. I wasn't 51. I'm in here. I'm 25 still today. 
And then he explained that the bottom half of the urethra is exquisitely sensitive to the loss of estrogen. It is the veritable canary in a coal mine when it comes to menopause. And he explained that I had estrogen atrophy in the lower half of my urethra. And so he re-prescribed the hormone and it took three or four times for me to rub it in before my symptoms completely went away. And so I would suspect that's probably one reason why your urethra is screaming. Another thing that can happen though, for a woman, your urethra is about the size of your pinky and halfway up around it, is a little tiny sea sponge of a gland called the periurethral gland. And it is the female prostate exam. It is a ex um, gland. It is a homologue to the male prostate. We women, we have a prostate. And like the male gland, it is known for being very dense and easily uh, uh, infected. Um, tiny, tiny drainage ducts get blocked. And before you know it, you've got the equivalent of a pimple on your urethra, on the outside of your urethra. When they, and, and like the male prostate, what they have to do is they've got to, they've got to express the fluid. And that's really hard to do in a woman. So basically the doctor will have a finger in your vagina and they will have a dilator in your urethra. And they're going to do like this to try to get the fluid out. And what they find is a lot of bacteria in this periurethral gland. But you can figure that out for yourself. It's actually, it'll take 30 seconds, take five seconds for you to figure out if you've got an infection of your periurethral gland. What you do is wash your hands really well, lay on your back, insert your finger in your vagina, rub along the top side, and it's about an inch in. And if you feel a painful lump, like a painful deep pimple, then you have an infection of the periurethral gland. You call your doctor and you get some help. If it's smooth and you feel no lumps, you do not have an infection. All right. The fifth cause of urethral pain is pelvic floor tension because, hello, here's your urethra and here are the muscles. You've got muscles that wrap right around your urethra. So if these muscles are tight, your urethra is going to be hurting. Number six, chemical irritation. If I put on a pair of underwear washed in sheer or tied, or if anybody uses a, a, a fabric softener or, or um, those dryer sheets for um, static, within five minutes, I will have urethral burning. Absolutely. Uh, my ex my, my ex, oh my God, I felt so bad because he was so new to it. He, um, he decided to make me a bubble bath and he made it with Irish spring liquid soap. And he's like, it was watching TV, he came out and got me. It's like, oh honey, I've made this, come on, I've, I've done something for you. And I walk in and I'm, I'm salted by the smell of Irish spring. And then I see the bathtub filled with bubbles. And I look at him and he's just so excited. It's like, I did this for you. And I'm looking at that going, crap, crap, crap. No, crap, 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 crap. And um, I looked at him and I looked at it and it was like, oh no. And I was like, thank you, honey. It's like, okay, I'm going to do it. And I, and I sat, I made the mistake of sitting in it for about five minutes. Oh, holy hell. I had to fly home. I cried on the plane for five hours. It hurt so bad. All right. So don't never underestimate chemical irritation, even from a spermicide. And last but not least, off gassing from panty liners and from pads. You have to remember that if you wear a panty liner or a pad every day, they're very, very thin. So the question is, is how do they absorb fluid? They use chemicals. And so they're fine when you put them on usually, but as soon as they get wet, they start off gassing chemicals. And I know this from personal experience. I used to love, I, in fact, I still wear the old always panty liners. I can't wear the new ones. The, the new ones, I absolutely get this burning sensation from whatever chemicals in there. So you could have some off gassing from a panty liner too. Hey, you know, listen, I have no shame. I'm willing to talk about anything as, uh, as most of you know. So going down to, to YouTube for a moment. 
Donna, do most urologists know 100 lesions when they see them? Not necessarily. However, we do have a new urine test coming out of Beaumont Hospital in Michigan, um, which is will be able to identify lesions just based upon a urinalysis rather than an examination. Our goal is to not ha you have to ha not for you to have to have a hydrodistension. Cher says, infant or pediatric catheter, or am I the only one unable to tolerate it? No, hun, Cher, girl, listen, so many people are, are intolerant to, uh, to catheters. The smaller, the better. Usually, pediatric, eight French is the way to go, low frit catheter. And in fact, wait a second, I think I had a sample. I was doing a lot of cleaning in my office here. Hold on. Where did I put it? Okay. Well, I have a sample somewhere. I'll, I'll do a, we'll maybe do a catheterization demo. Maybe what I'll do is I'll try to get some companies to send me some sample catheters and we'll go over them on, uh, in, a, in a lecture so that you can see them. All righty. All righty. Um, Christine is saying in Facebook, I believe people need to be drug tested. What the hell are you talking about? That is a total lie. Why would you even say that? You know, that's just not okay, hon. Uh, I'm sorry, but, uh, you're, you're, if you're going to say stuff like that, you need to get the hell out of here. You know, you can't make everybody happy, but it's it's crazy when people uh, make up lies like that, and they do. Um, guys, give me a, give me a quick moment here. Alrighty, give me a quick moment. You know, I have absolutely learned that you cannot make everybody happy, and I don't try to make everybody happy, but I absolutely do try to give you the right information and. Not only is that not true, I chaired the state of California pain conference that led to the governor signing the pain patients bill of rights. You know, I mean, so I'm sorry, but holy hell, I don't know what you're talking about. Give me a moment here. Hold on, just hold on. Give me a quick moment. All right, let's go back to your questions here. Thank you, you guys. I really appreciate that. Caitlin says, I'm only 23 and my diagnosis list was ridiculous. So was mine. You know, by the time I was 23, I had... I had frequency urgency syndrome, I had vulvodynia, I had irritable bowel, and low thyroid because I'm in IC subtype 5 central sensitization. It's absolutely wackadoodle, right? Totally wackadoodle. All right. Tracy says, I got on birth control when your symptoms started much better after a year, much better after a year after you got off of it, but still not in remission plus pelvic floor dysfunction. You know, Tracy, in this IC subtype 2 bladder wall driven, I absolutely believe that there's a hormone subtype. I absolutely believe that there is a hormone subtype. 
and um, uh, it hasn't been clearly defined. There are some people who get better when they go on um, birth control, and there are some people who get worse when they get on birth control. And that's just one of those sub subtypes that really, really needs to be fleshed out. Have I ever heard of Kangen water? No, I have not heard of Kangen water. Is that must be alkaline water? Sue, how do I find out if I truly had lessons? If these doctors have retired, I was told I, I was told I did, but they were never treated. Oh, how do you? Okay, so actually, the question is, how do you find out if you had lesions if those doctors retired? Hopefully, hun, they use, they still have your medical records, or they sent your medical records to your new doctor. Thank you, Michelle. Thank you for your kind words. I appreciate that. Sue says she's having nerve pain since her hysterectomy and the surgeon tells me I don't. My pelvic floor pain lights up about an hour after I eat or after a bowel movement and he just tells me it's a stomach ache. Um, Sue, um, you know, uh, as a fellow hysterectomy survivor, I can absolutely tell you that it took about a year for my nerves to calm down. So if you are in that one year period, you just have to remember that that procedure is so traumatic to you that not only are the core nerves, but all the peripheral nerves in that area are definitely going to be more sensitive. Um, I also had a lot of rectal pain when I was going through mine and, and that was spasms of the pelvic floor muscles. If you would ever like to talk about that, please feel free to give me a phone call to, uh, next week sometime, 1-800-928-7496. That would be awesome. And also, um, uh, Hister Sisters is a fabulous website for people recovering from hysterectomy. I'm, uh, Bumika says, I've had a series of UTIs, later pelvic pain, clitoral pain started. You feel like you have IC subtype two and three. Any Anything acidic troubles me, causes me pelvic pain, only fine. And you're on an anti-inflammatory diet, take pregabalid. Okay. Well, the lead story in our magazine that is at the typesetter right now is about some of the other things that we have been able to link to bladder symptoms. And so, you know, um, there may be another unusual cause for your pain. The fact that anything acidic is bothering your bladder tells us we've got to focus on your bladder. I think since you've had a series of UTIs, it would be absolutely reasonable for you to have a next generation urine test. Let's make sure that you don't have any other chronic infection. Next generation urine testing looks at bacteria in a different way. It looks for DNA. And you can just go to bladderhealth.org to watch some videos about it. So maybe you've got a chronic infection or a drug resistant infection, or maybe you have a fungal candida infection from all the antibiotics you had to take because of your urinary tract infections. That is indeed a possibility, hun. So I, I out of a out of an abundance of caution, doing something like this makes sense. Of course, being on an anti-inflammatory diet is a smart and good thing to do, uh, but you're still a diagnostic mystery to be solved. We've got to figure out why you're still having bladder pain. And also, you know, I also call it the chicken versus the egg dilemma, which comes first, the chicken or the egg. And for us, it's which comes first, the bladder or the pelvic floor. So for some people, it starts with a bladder injury and then your muscles get tight. For other people, it starts with a muscle injury and then the bladder gets involved. So you also haven't said what's going on with your pelvic floor. If you've got tight pelvic floor muscles, you've got to work with a pelvic floor physical therapist. A pel and and because we don't know, are you having pelvic floor spasms or are you having bladder wall spasms? I'm not sure. But 
you know, almost everybody has both. You got some bladder wall stuff and you got some pelvic floor stuff. We've just got to figure out what is driving what. We have to figure out what is driving what. All righty. Yeah, burning before. And Maureen says she has burning before and after peeing every day. So Maureen, the answer, the question is, is that pain internal or external? Where is it specifically? Robin asks, any suggestions to get through a colonoscopy prep? Okay, so you can't get through the Miralax prep? So with the Miralax prep, are you dissolving that in water? Or are you dissolving that in Gatorade? The, the Miralax prep is absolutely the best for IC. It doesn't irritate the bladder at all. Of course, the challenge is just getting it down. So when I had my colonoscopy, I did two different, I did uh, Gatorade and didn't bother my bladder at all. The mistake I made is I did the same flavor of Gatorade. And getting that second container down is really hard. I really recommend doing a completely different flavor the second time. Sue, just got off 10 days of antibiotics for a dental implant, now in a huge flare, regular stuff not helping. Sue, if it was amoxicillin or augmentin, that would probably be why you're in the flare. So you've just got to do things that are calming and soothing to your bladder to give your bladder an opportunity to calm down, chamomile, herbal tea, follow the diet, yada, yada. Carrie says, why are my legs so tight? My thighs seem larger, they hurt, what can I do? Carrie, you probably have some pretty funky pelvic floor dysfunction going on, so you need to go have a pelvic floor assessment. Let's see what's going on with those muscles down there. Angela says, uh, Angela, safe colonoscopy prep, a uh, Miralax protocol. A Miralax protocol has four pills of biscuit biscotal, um, with a glass of water, and then an hour later, you down a half of a Miralax in a quart of Gatorade or a quart of water, and then two hours later, you do it again. And that's considered the safest, but it's really rare that patients struggle with a colonoscopy prep. Anna wants to know the name of the European IC specialist, Dr. Nordling, Jorgen Nordling, N-O-R-D-L-I-N-G. And he is in uh, the Netherlands. Then there's a there are several really good IC doctors in Europe. You've got Dr. Uh, oh, it's in Magnus Fall in Sweden or Norway, although he might be retired. There are a couple of doctors in England. Uh, uh, Dr. Claudio something in Italy. I can get you their names. I, and I have names on our website in our doctor list. And guys, our doctor finder database is working again. Woohoo! Yay. <laughs> so if you're looking for a doctor or physical therapist, you can go over to our website in our find a specialist area. And our database is working and I'll be adding about 200 more names probably in the next month. Aaron, can you have referred pain in your hip and left leg? Yes, but the odds are that's probably your pelvic floor muscles. If you've got pain, so, okay, so, so here are your hip bones, right? Right, okay, so here are your hip bones. If you push right on the inside of your hip bones, if it's painful, as it is for me on my right side. Oh, that means your pelvic floor is pretty tight. Those are those are pelvic floor uh, attachment points. So again, Aaron, it actually might be pelvic floor pain referring to your bladder rather than your bladder pain referring to your hip. Stacy says, what teas are safe to drink? Chamomile herbal tea, peppermint herbal tea, rubos herbal tea, if you do well with the chamomile and the peppermint. Dottie says she had to quit Elmeron for 20 years because her retina was changing. Two weeks in Sister Protec and you're doing okay. Yeah. 
So for anybody who doesn't know, Elmeron, the only FDA-approved medication approved for IC, has actually been linked now to retinal damage, macular uh, pigmentary maculopathy. And so at a minimum, if you've been taking Elmeron, you should go have an eye exam. Let's make sure your retinas are okay. If your retinas are changing color, you're probably going to need to stop the medication. If your retinas, gonna, if your retinas are normal, power on. Uh, but pay attention to any changes in your vision if you're taking Elmeron. We have a we currently have a citizens petition in with the FDA right now. Alexa says she's been drinking cucumber water and it's yummy and icy friendly. Good. I actually love cucumber water. Charlene says, "Have I heard of CNR therapy?" Uh, let me refresh my memory here. What is it? Well, I mean, it, it just looks like a, a, a variant of tens, you know? It's called self-controlled Ener Energo Neuroadaptive Regulator, invented 40 years ago at a Russian university. The aims are providing non-invasive effective treatment of the human body as a whole. It's a form of interactive neurostimulation. Yeah, guys, it's a, it's a TENS unit. <laughs> it's, it's just a TENS unit. And TENS can work for some people. I wouldn't look at it and it as anything special, Charlene. Sherry says, the manufacturers are discontinuing the 2% lidocaine jelly or gel with the nozzle for urethral insertion. Do you know of an alternative to lidocaine for relieving the urethra? Um, 4 to 5% lidocaine comes in a different formula like an ointment or a cream, but my pharmacist says it's not suitable for internal use. Uh, most of them are using the lidocaine jelly. Let me, um, let me make a note of that, see if I can do some research for you. All righty. Let's see. So lidocaine. Um, hold on. Two, the two percent lidocaine with bulb. I'll reach out to some of the IC doctors and see if I can get an answer for you. Okay, hun. I do not know. I do not know. Alexa says she's got pictures of her bladder. She can see, and she feels like she can see lesions or ulcers. I may be seeing things, but who knows? So Alexis on our website, I have a whole bunch of pictures of bladders. Uh, I see bladders with hydrodistension. You should compare your picture with some of those pictures. We also have a video on YouTube of a hunter's lesion uh, uh, at, as they slowly stretch the bladder and kind of what it does. You might find that very helpful. Carol, a big giant hug to you, hon. I know exactly how you feel. Be strong, my friend. Be strong. Always keep asking questions. Never give up. Remember, the human body is wired to heal. Healing is happening every single day. If you fell and skinned your knee, you'd have a scab on it tomorrow. You have to remember that that absolutely is happening in your bladder right now, too. How are candida, Sue asks, how are candida infections in the bladder treated? Um, they're treated normally with an oral antifungal, which is going to be Nystatin or Diflucan, often extended. You don't just take one or two. Sometimes it will have you take one a day for a week, depending upon the severity of your symptoms.
Cindy says, so the augmentin I used when you were sick with the flu isn't good? Well, honey, a flu is viral. You shouldn't have even been taking an antibiotic anyway if you had the a viral flu. Now, if you had, as an example, a sinusitis, a sinus infection, then using an antibiotic would have been reasonable. Uh, augmentin is one of the better ones for that. But unfortunately, it is indeed well known for irritating the bladder. Augmentin is a pretty tough antibiotic. In contrast, it's, it, it's much less risky than Cipro. We certainly are not taking Cipro anymore uh, for simple UTI or sinus infections because of the major risk of uh, aortic aneurysm, uh, central nervous system dysfunction. We have a whole blog on our website called Have You Been Floxed uh, about Cipro that we talked about last week with a big consumer alert. Sue, so what is the best kind of lubricant? If you have IC type 5, it's going to be KY or something like that or Medicine Mama's uh, V-Magic. Becky, she has leg and hip pain from pelvic floor dysfunction. So do I <laughs> on my left side. Robin says, reason a colonoscopy prep is hard is because after the second or third glass, you start getting bladder pain. The pain gets worse with each glass. So, so Robin, um, sometimes what they have you do when you're going to have a colonoscopy, normally what they tell you to do is for about two or three days beforehand to really lighten up your diet, to not eat anything that is very fibrous and um, that thick, right? Like a steak. So I wonder if you could talk to your doctor instead about maybe going on a restricted diet, a low, uh, you know, um, for like four days beforehand. It's going to be hard, but you doing soups, like chicken noodle soup, things like that. Applesauce, even applesauce might be a little hard, but things that are super, super easy to digest. So that the night before you have the, col the colonoscopy, you can get away with maybe just four glasses. I bet there's a dietary way to handle that. On the other hand, the other, I think, really, really important question for us to ask is why is your bladder so sensitive to volume? And I wonder if you have lesions that could be treated first. If we could get those lesions treated, maybe you wouldn't have so much pain. But I bet where there's a will, there's a way. I And maybe you could do the biscotal, which would push, you know, which would start everything, couple of glasses of the prep, and then maybe uh, a couple of flea enemas. Um, uh, or I now I remember as a kid, um, what was that? Um, Gosh, you know what? I was in junior high and I went to have my first bladder exam, which was an IVP, and they had me do Epsom salts the night before. And of course, nobody told me. You know, imagine being, what, 13 years old? And they're like, hey, drink this. You have no clue what's going to happen next. You have no clue that you've got a volume. <laughs> you've got a volcano of crap that's going to come out, to, out of you in the next couple of hours. Uh, so I wonder if maybe something like that. I don't know, hon. I don't know. There's got to be a protocol for you, though. There's got to be a protocol out there for you. And you know what? Listen, ultimately, in the end, you can only do what you can do. And uh, so just do the best you can. Have them do it. And um, hopefully they can see what they need to see. But it's a tricky situation. I'm sorry. I'm Catherine Keo says she has Hunter's lesions. Should you be tested to see if they are caused by a virus? Um, um, you could. Uh, the uh, Microgen, the company that does the next generation urine tests, they do have a viral tests that you can order. Um, but I, you know, it's funny. I asked one of the big IC docs over in Europe, you know, because they screen for viruses before they make a diagnosis of IC. And it was like, okay, when you find a virus, what do you do? <laughs> and his answer was, not much, not much. So, uh, I, I, I mean, it, it would be an interesting piece of the puzzle. 
but this is just an area in IC research that is still really, really vague, hun. I don't have good answers for you. I mean, I think for a patient with a lot of lesions that are not getting better or that are recurring, it might be interesting to try an antiviral. You know, they do antivirals. If you have uh, that virus that makes your face, what do you call it when you get a virus on your face and it makes your face kind of uh, the herpes. There's a herpes virus that can hit a nerve here and, and your, your cheek can collapse for a couple of weeks and they put you on an antivirus for that. So this is the, the cutting edge of IC research right now. Cindy says, you stop the Elmeron and ate more raw vegetables. A lady who had IC told me this can work. Uh, no, a raw vegetable is not going to provide a coating to your bladder, but eating a good, healthy diet filled with vegetables is it's not anything I'm going to disagree with. But if you're menopausal and you have a thin bladder coating, then, then using something that can provide a coating effect just makes sense. It makes total sense. And so Sister Protex, Sister Renew would be reasonable at that point in time. But raw vegetables are not going to fix menopause-induced uh, estrogen atrophy. Dottie says uh, on pigmentary maculopathy, she had no vision problems, but her retina looks terrible. Seeing a retina specialist next week to review the test results. So even if you don't have vision changes, long-term Elmeron patients should still get checked out and I was only on 200 milligrams per day. Yeah, hon, I'm so sorry. I'm really glad you're being very, very proactive there. That's a smart thing to do. All right. Sam says, always had leukocytes in your urine, but you were always negative for infection. I've had IC for 25 years. I'm going to see a doctor in London to see if the cause of my IC is embedded infection. Is that really possible after so long? Uh, yeah. I, I mean, why not get a check? But let me explain why IC patients have leukocytes. I mean, it's really, really fascinating. Pretty much anytime you have a flare and you test your urine, Let's see here. All right. So this is a UTI test strip, right? And if you're like most patients, whenever you have a flare, especially if you're in your first year, you keep thinking you've got infection over and over and over. When in fact, no, you're probably having a flare. And when you do this test, Many patients with flares are positive for leukocytes, but not for nitrites. Nitrites are produced by bacteria. If you've got a positive nitrite, you have infection. If you have a negative nitrite, you might not have infection. So why do I see patients have leukocytes in their urine? It's a really interesting explanation. So let's, let's look at this picture again. So here you go. You have an injury of some type of your bladder. Who knows what it caused? Let's just say it was augmenting, okay? Because your bladder coating is damaged, the irritants of your urine are getting deeper into these tissues. Now, the human body is a miracle when it comes to, to protecting itself. And so as soon as it senses these where it's not supposed to be, your body is going to mobilize white blood cells, leukocytes. And remember, leukocytes are, are your warriors. Leukocytes swarm the area and kill whatever they can. That's their job, is they're your warriors. So here you've got, let's just say, uh, coffee. Now, coffee is not an infection. You've got a byproduct of coffee that has reached this layer. So your body generates uh, leukocytes that come up the blood vessel and, and actually these circles right here, these are your blood vessels. So they swarm the area up the blood vessels. But how do they get here? How do they get 
from the blood vessel up to where the irritant is penetrating your bladder wall. And it turns out that your capillaries, the tiniest little blood vessels in here, they open and they let the, uh, the white blood vessels out to go fight whatever is here. And that is why you te we tend to have white blood vessels and leukocytes in our urine during flares. That does not mean you have infection. It's more a sign of your body's attempt to fight whatever the hell is going on, okay? Cindy, is there anything on TV about the Elmeron issues? No, uh, however, I did, um, uh, I had two new eye doctors contact me who had new patients, I see patients um, with pigmentary maculopathy and I connected them with Emory, with the researchers at Emory. Then the eye researchers at Emory uh, let me know that they have a couple more papers coming out sh documenting even more IC patients with eye damage. And they're getting ready to do a big national study and they're inviting a lot of eye doctors around the country to participate. So that is continuing. And as far as I know, the company has not made any official reaction or response to this. Here, hold on a second. I got to write something down here. Okay. Yes. I always have to make notes because you're giving me work to do for the coming week. All right. Irene says, she has lesions and your frequency isn't very high. Your main problem is extreme pain. It's like being stabbed with a knife. And yes, I have tried physical therapy. It didn't help me at all with the pain. Also lidocaine, hydrodistension helps me a, a lot. But honey, seriously, you haven't done the most important thing. What about injecting a steroid into the lesion? Have they done a triamcinolone injection? You know, that's the most important thing. A, a pelvic floor physical therapy is not going to help a lesion. Uh, a rescue installation might numb a lesion temporarily, but it's not going to stop a lesion. What's going to stop a lesion is a steroid injection to fight the inflammation. So, Aaron, that's the important question there. It was for mono. Thank you, Renee, for sharing that. Uh, Renee um, had mono and she called, asked about high dose vitamin C infusions a couple of months ago. I don't remember what I said, but that her primary care provider said absolutely not that it would burn up your bladder. And so that's good. That's good that he said no, but that multivitamin infusions are helping you. And they're probably helping you because they're infusions. So you're, bypass you're bypassing the stomach, although you're, you're, they're still you know, the, the, the vitamins are still being released through your urine though. So mm, I'm glad they're not bothering you. That's good. Hi, John. Uh, Renee says she's doing vinyasa yoga. It's helpful for pelvic floor dysfunction. Cindy is recommending estrusy, non-acidic estrusy. Absolutely. That's a way to do if you need vitamin C or you're going to eat a lot of broccoli and green peppers, which are high in vitamin C. Jessica said she's newly diagnosed, 37 years old. Frequency and pressure are your main symptoms. You have urodynamics scheduled for next week. I'm so confused where to even start or with your subtype. So Jessica, come on over to our website, watch our Living With IC video series. And I want you to watch the first two videos, the five subtypes of IC and the six steps of treatment. And then call me if you'd like, you can call the IC network next week and I'd be happy to help you.
Ravonda says Gatorade has citric acid in it. Are there any other options that won't irritate the bladder? Uh, you can do uh, uh, water. You could maybe do a chamomile herbal tea. Uh, see if your doctor would be okay with that. Um, Gatorade, you know, the clear Gatorades are usually the better Gatorades um, rather than the heavily colored ones. <laughs> And, you know, some people are just more sensitive than others. I was able to handle the Gatorade, didn't have a flare from it at all. Some can and some can't, but I do not do red Gatorades. You wouldn't do a red or an orange Gatorade anyway, if you were gonna have uh, a colonoscopy, you have to use a different color, blue or green, but clear is always the best. Yeah, Cindy says dilute the Gatorade. Absolutely dilute the Gatorade. You know, cup of Gatorade, three cups of water, two cups of water, that would work too. You could always throw in a pre-leaf, see if your doctor would be okay with you also taking a pre-leaf with that Gatorade. Carol says, she used CBD suppositories for a flare. It seemed to help. I was wondering if they could upset the flora in your vagina. I don't see how they would upset you the flora in your vagina because CBD is not a... Uh, bacteria and it's not there's no there shouldn't be sugar in it so i wouldn't imagine that it would hi june june says she's very overwhelmed and scared she's had been symptoms for only two months you know, june hun number one come to our website watch the two videos the five the five subtypes of ic and the six steps of treatment watch those videos first and then call me. I actually also have a couple of videos in there for newly diagnosed patients, how to prepare for doctor's appointments. And then if you have questions, call me, hon. That's my job is to help you not be scared. Feel free to call. The IC Network is the only group that actually answers the phone and takes questions for free. I'm happy to do that. I'm happy to do that. Angela says she didn't realize the Gatorade was safe for IC. It's not safe for everyone, but it's safe for most of us. Um, as long as you're not doing a lot of it every day, but if you're seriously dehydrated and you need some fluids, a little bit of Gatorade can, can be okay. Renee says she's using a compounded gabapentin Valium lidocaine cream for her abdominal and bladder pain. Yeah, that's a great pain. Um, what did we call it? Um, there's also a, a similar one, but it also contains baclofen and they call it, uh, it's, uh, there's another one that's called Amibac, A-M-I-B-A-C, which is an amitriptyline, uh, baclofen, lidocaine, and something else in it. So there are some compounded creams that can be very, very helpful. Laura had a bladder infection eight months ago, was on different, uh, that was difficult to get rid of. You're on many antibiotics, including Cipro. Ever since you've had terrible pudendal nerve pain, <sighs> tried pelvic floor therapy, osteopath, chiropractor, acupuncture, and supplements, but still the pain, wondering if the Cipro could have caused that. Uh, I don't know, hun. I, I don't know. That's a question for your pharmacist. See what they have to say. Um, Remember though, that when you have a really, really bad infection, your pelvic floor muscles are gonna get tight in the guarding reflex. So I would be looking at, uh, I, I would look again at your pelvic floor muscles. Let's make sure they're not stuck in spasm. Um, and also too, I would look at fungal infections. Is there any chance that you have picked up a yeast infection, a chronic fungal infection in your bladder that would be explaining some of this? So guys, when I'm looking up, I'm looking at Facebook. When I'm looking down, I'm looking at YouTube because we are simulcasting um, on both platforms. And hey guys, if you like these meetings, would you please make sure that you like this Facebook page or you subscribe to our YouTube page? 
It would be really, really helpful for us if you did that. Um, and also go on over to Twitch TV. We're going to be starting up on Twitch TV this spring where I can show you screenshots. And I'm very, very happy about that too. Sue says so she's at leukocytes in your urine, never knew why. Yeah, me too. June says she was told at the ER that you were tested positive for nitrites, but you didn't have an infection. That is impossible. Nitrites are not made by the human body. They're not produced by the human body. If you have nitrites in your urine, you have infection. John says, are there any antibiotics that are better tolerated by the bladder? Um, yeah, Keflex. Keflex is better. The cephalosporins uh, seem to be the easiest on the bladder in my experience. Becky says, when she, uh, that you mentioned menopause and atrophy, I've been using hormone cream for the past year or so. It's been really helpful. I started it for vaginal atrophy, but it helps a lot with my IC2. I still have to be really careful with my diet and keep up with my physical therapy, but I'm much better. Awesome. That's what I love to hear. I'm way better with my estrogen cream too. Uh, Jessica says she's confused about the new diagnosis. So, so again, Jessica, go to our website and watch the video, the five subtypes of IC, so that you can see the different things that can trigger, quote, unquote, IC, also known as urinary frequency, urgency, pressure, pain. It might not be your bladder. It could be your pelvic floor muscles. Liz says, if you eat something that's on the caution list, let's say about a tablespoon of tomato sauce and it doesn't bother you or cause a flare, are you still damaging your progress? No, I don't think so. But I think if you did it every day, you would be. Um, if you're IC subtype one, IC subtype two, and you've got bladder wall damage, you've got to remember, you've got to remember the acid, the acid on this tender tissue can be damaging, but it's about quantity of acid. Okay, so we think about it this way. A cup of tomato sauce is the acid of a dozen tomatoes that have been stewed down. There's a ton of acid in a cup of tomato sauce. A slice of a tomato on a sandwich, tiny amount of acid. Odds are you're gonna be able to have a slice on your tomato, a slice of tomato on your sandwich, no problem at all especially a yellow tomato because um, yellow tomatoes are even lower in acid. So you, and homegrown tomatoes are much better. It's the mass market tomatoes that are picked before they're ripe that tend to have a lot of acid. So am I worried about one tablespoon of tomato sauce? Absolutely not. Am I worried about having a cup of tomato sauce? Yes. Um, and so remember that there can be kind of cumulative ir irritation. But can you have a piece of pizza with tomato sauce on it? Probably, probably, but white sauce would be better. But I just, I wouldn't be chowing down on a hot pepperoni pizza with tomato. I mean, I think that you're throwing the tomato sauce, you're throwing the chemicals from the pepperoni, you're throwing the spices of the pepperoni. For goodness sake, get a white sauce with veggies on it, or ham or mushroom, something like that, much more bladder friendly. Jessica says, you're 37 years old, symptoms came out of nowhere, frequency, urgency every once in a while, your back and your belly button. So Jessica, really, we're always now looking first for pelvic floor muscle injury. And so that's the one of the first things that I would be looking at is, has anything happened to your pelvic floor? Have you had a child? Have you had surgery? Do you have a fibroid that's pushing on your bladder? Um, uh, that would be something else that would be important to consider. The fact that you're having back pain and belly button pain, that's very interesting. Again, that makes me think more muscle than it does bladder. Melissa says she's taking a two milligram estradiol pill because of her hysterectomy to control hot flashes, but you also have urethral pain. Would you suggest a topical estrogen? Yes, yes. In fact, the topical estrogen in preference to 
the uh, oral estrogen, although you've already had the hysterectomy, so you don't have to worry about uterine cancer from taking oral estrogen, but there is still the risk of oral estrogen of causing some breast cancer, and that's why I'm not taking it. Uh, but I do take topical estrogen for sure. And I really need it. And it really helps me. If I don't use my topical estrogen cream, my urethra starts screaming in about 10 days. Jessica, thank you so much. Is urodynamics necessary? No, not for a diagnosis of IC. It is not a diagnostic test for IC. However, it does test to see if the nerves in your bladder are functioning normally. It's a controversy. A little bit of a controversy, you know, uh, if you look at the AUA guidelines for IC, the American Urology Association for uh, uh, guidelines, they say a urodynamics is only necessary if there's a complicating factor that they want to check out. Uh, uh, guys, if you haven't had a urodynamics, it tests the nerve function of your bladder. What they do is they slowly fill your bladder with fluid. And then they ask you the question, tell us when you first feel the need to urinate. And you're like going, okay, I feel it. You know, you're laying there going, okay, I feel it. And they go, okay, tell me when you first feel pain. And you're going, okay, I feel it. You can stop now. And they go, they go, and, and what they do is they push a wee bit past that. They're just really trying to test what we call your waking bladder capacity. Uh, I've had it done. It wasn't terrible. It wasn't the, you know, it wasn't the worst thing I've ever done in the world. Um, but I, I I would bring somebody with you because you want to drive home. Uh, you won't want to drive home by yourself. And you're probably going to need maybe a little bit of pain medicine afterwards. Your urethra is probably going to be a little bit unhappy. That'll go away in a day or two. Uh, but it's really just excluding stuff. I mean, I would ask the doctor the reason why. Why do you want to do it? Oops, oops, sorry. I just realized I'm not showing my favorite posters. If Atara Shamel was in here, she she did these beautiful posters here. We will be heard, believe in your healing, practice compassion. So for those of you who I sent cards to, you're always gonna get probably one of her cards. And she is living proof that um, you can do beautiful, great things even when you have pelvic pain. And these are used as fundraising for uh, pelvic pain and pudendal neuralgia and things like that. So if you like these cards, um, you can uh, buy them on the IC network. Um, here, look at this. Let me just show this to you. You know, you, you know. I mean, seriously, we got to support each other. If anybody out there is doing some art related to IC or you have something that you want to sell, I mean, please feel free to send a sample to me so I can look at it. But look at these incredible cards. Practice compassion for yourself daily. God, I love that. Um, she was on a journey towards healing. I love this one. Sister, you are not broken. I see Awareness Month. We will be heard. I mean, these are just absolutely stunning cards. So anyway, you can find, uh, I think we have, we still have a few left in our store if you're interested in buying any. Uh, Carol uses Thermacare menstrual heat wraps when you're in a flare. They're great on the go. They, st they stick on your body. Let me give you an option for that. Hold on. Let me go get them. I've got an option that's cheaper. Uh, 
All right. This is my secret weapon. I will tell you right now because of my pelvic floor stuff, right? Body heat heating pads are to die for good. And um, so these, Carol says she's getting the Thermacare menstrual heat wraps, you and a flare, that, and you stick it on your body. These you don't stick on your body, you stick on like your underwear. Um, and they will last eight to 10 hours. And they're basically $3.99 for three, for three of them, um, a buck each. So I was wearing one yesterday because I hurt my back yesterday. Sometimes I will wear three up my left side of my back. When I'm traveling, I always put one here. So, so look at this, because completely flat, nobody will have a clue that you're wearing a heating pad. It gets activated when you peel off the back. And I will, I will normally put it like right here, but on the inside of my pants, right? So like, bam, no one has a clue. If you got to take a long car ride or a plane flight, that's what you want to wear. Put it on about an hour ahead of time and, and within an hour, it'll get nice and hot and you're gold. Uh, these are wonderful. So if you, you know what, why don't we do this? We haven't done our, we have not done our free giveaway. I will send a free heating pad to everyone who sends me their mail, uh, their mailing address. Every single one of you, you want a heating pad, I will send you a heating pad, okay? So you can try it out. So that's our freebie to, for today. Let me give you, so if you want a heating pad, you need to send your mailing address to icnetwork at mac.com. I see network at Mac.com. I will tell you, we have had these for 20 years, 15 years. The price has never gone up. $3.99. And so great deal. You can buy 30 of them on our website, I think, for I don't know. I don't You can look at it over in our store on our website. But if you want a free sample of this heating pad, please send your mailing address. To IC network at mac.com. And uh, it might take me a, a week to get it done because I got to put it in a bigger envelope and a, I don't have a lot of those envelopes, but uh, I can get them. I'll order them. I'll get some of these. I'll we'll probably send out about a hundred of them, but I'm happy to do it if you want to try it on. I mean, seriously, we're all IC brothers and sisters here. I want you to carry hope into your heart and I want you to find some comfort and heating pads will work amazingly for me, especially at night. Cindy, what's the website we're talking about? We're talking about the Interstitial Cystitis Network website, which is my website, ic-network.com. I built the IC Network. 25 years ago this year in 1994 as a way of bringing support to patients who were homebound. It is modeled after a dissertation at Stanford. It was my doctoral dissertation proposal for uh, uh, getting a PhD in psychology. Unfortunately, believe it or not, I couldn't do it because I couldn't drive in the car. So I got my master's, did not get my PhD, but I'm very happy that our website has helped millions of patients now for 25 years. I still like to get that PhD. I think I've earned it and I and I've got I'm fascinated by the research, but I I, I cannot afford to put seventy five thousand dollars into uh, a program. I have to look at my retirement now. That money needs to be in my retirement fund. Uh, Kristen Penny says, I absolutely cannot tolerate any estrogen. I even tried a compounded DHEA cream on the outside of my vagina and urethra. Is there any non-estrogen treatment uh, for frequent UTIs? So Kristen, um, yeah, let me, uh, let me go get a couple things.
Okay. So uh, number one, uh, uh, I don't know if I'm quite prepared to give up on estrogen. The Women's International Pharmacy uh, in Arizona is known for working with complex drug sensitivities, and they can put the estrogen in a lot of different bases. They can put it in an oil base. They can put it in a propylene glycol-free base. So if I were you, I would call the Women's International Pharmacy, womensinternational.com, and tell them about your extreme sensitivity and see if they have any options for you. Um, ultimately, in the end, the most important thing for you to do if you get frequent UTIs is to use a peri bottle just with water. You've got to remember that, um, a, well, in the old days, we used to like to say that they used to like to say that UTIs were from were from bad hygiene. Now we know that some UTIs actually come from food, um, that especially from meat, from meats. The very interesting case of college students who all got a really rare UTI in Idaho, Washington, Oregon. They were able to trace it back to a specific um, uh, butcher. Uh, who is supplying food to to universities so is very interesting drug resistant infection. So you can get UTIs from food. So it is important that you uh, make sure you buy your meat from maybe a local source rather than a mass produced source. I think it should be organic, not made with any antibiotics because it's the meat production that uses overuses antibiotics that causes the issues. Okay, but ultimately in the end, Whenever you have a bowel movement or whenever you pee, toilet paper does not get all the bacteria off your skin, but water does. So every member of the IC network gets a free peri bottle, fill it up with water, leave it next to your toilet. Every single time you pee or poop, rinse yourself off, then pat dry. That's the single most easy thing that you can do to try to, to, try to prevent a UTI. We used to have a really good body wash called Very Private Body Wash. Unfortunately, the competitor bought that that company and stopped producing it, which is a terrible shame. Um, the other thing that I don't know, this, might, this isn't necessarily going to help prevent an infection, but what it is going to do is it is going to perhaps put a coating on your skin so you so that it's not so dry and vulnerable to infection. Medicine Mama's V Magic is um, it's the equivalent of mucus only it comes from organic olive oil. It's super light. It's super super light. I mean it's not like Vaseline at all. I don't know if you can see that. Really really light. You can put it right on your skin there ideal for people who have estrogen atrophy and they're they're dry and painful and they can't use estrogen cream. So I would look at Medicine Mama's V Magic. And we have this available in the IC Network shop. So if you go to our website and just click shop, shop, look under feminine hygiene and you'll see it. And if you guys want more peri bottles, there are, I think, three and a quarter, uh, somewhere in there. They're under restroom supplies in the IC Network shop. It took me two years to find the supplier for these. <laughs> it was hy hysterical trying to find these so that we could offer them to patients. June, can a uterine polyp put pressure on your bladder? Absolutely. Absolutely. And we uh, we have research that shows that when you re when you remove those fibroids or polyps, that the bladder symptoms go away for the, for the majority of patients. Cindy said, "So are you saying children could have caused this? Is it related to IC, honey? When you carry a baby and when you have a child, you stress your pelvic floor muscles, and floor pelvic floor muscles are often injured and traumatized during childbirth and delivery." And so if your muscles are injured, then what happens is they get weak and then they get tight to overcompensate and that causes a host of other bladder problems. So absolutely, having a child, a difficult delivery, getting torn in delivery, is a well-known trigger for IC. And it's really underneath it all caused by an injury to the pelvic floor muscles. <laughs>
Cindy, is IC related to IBS? It is for a, it is for some of us. Yes, it's it's related to IBS uh, for a couple of reasons. For those of us in who are in IC subtype five central sensitization, we are hardwired with a more sensitive stomach, a more sensitive bowel, and a more sensitive bladder. That is the way our body was built. It is the gift of our ancestry. In my case, from Norway. Okay, but the other thing that's really interesting is that the nerves for the bladder and the and the bowel merge right at the spinal cord. And so we know that there's something called neural crosstalk. So we have proof that when the bowel gets irritated, the bladder can become irritated. When the bladder becomes irritated, the bowel can become irritated. And I have a picture of that. Let's see if I can find that picture. Here it is. Alrighty then, let's see here. Let me see, I think it's in this book. Let me see if I can find this picture to show you. It's really interesting. Here we go. So this is the book, When It Hurts Down Here by Dr. Angie Storr, 15 Proven Techniques to Alleviate Pelvic Pain. I recommend this book highly. It is the best book ever on helping patients understand how pain is processed and how you can interfere with pain messages to reduce your pain. Hi, Cher. Cher uh, I'm about five minutes behind people coming in, but Cher just came in. Cher's Somebody I love to read what she writes. She is a beautiful writer. All right. Okay. So one of the things that she says in here is she talks about how all the nerves in the pelvis for the bladder, for the bowel, et cetera, the, the clitoris, reproductive tract, they merge up at the spinal cord. And in fact, they have done radioactive tracer studies well, they'll put one radioactive tracer in your bladder nerves, one radioactive tracer in the bowel nerves, and they follow them and they find them both in the same nerve near the spinal cord or at the spinal cord. And that's why there's a strong correlation between IC and IBS for those of us who suffer with both, myself included. Cindy, where do you buy the heating pads? Uh, you can buy at least the body heat heating pads right on our website. Kathy Vaden Tap, are you in here? Kathy Vaden Tap. Kathy, 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 you won this. You won this, but you never sent me your address, or at least I didn't find it. So Kathy Vaden Tap, if you are in here, this cookbook is for you from our last meeting. And if you could please send me an email, icnetwork at map.com, I would love to send you this book. It's sitting here on my desk waiting for you. Donna over on YouTube says she loves V Magic. Yeah, I do too. Lori Clanky on YouTube says the, these are called body heat heating pads. Body heat heating pads. Elizabeth, can you use the heating pad on your lower back if you have interesting implants? I don't know. You normally we don't want to heat metal. So I I certainly wouldn't do it over over uh, the the unit. I mean, you might be able to get away with it on your lower abdomen, but probably not on your back. You need to you need to call the company uh, Medtronic, talk to their patient line, and see if if that's okay, or ask your doctor. I just don't know. Uh, Mary Moose from Australia. Do you know of any specials or referrals for someone in Australia? Yes, Claire Fowler. Claire Fowler, MD, is the leading IC expert in Australia. So Google her name, Claire, C-L-A-I-R-E, Fowler, F-O-W-L-E-R. 
She comes to the U.S. She goes to the international IC conferences. Haven't seen her in a couple of years, but I haven't been to a lot of them in a couple of years. I've had other other fish to fry. Urologist says, you, uh, Kristen says, you've got a Klebsiella pneumonia. Oh, that's terrible. Good luck, hon. And it was, well, it was Stanford, but I didn't even get started. I, I, what I did as part of my application is I gave them what my dissertation was going to be on and, and gave them the initial presentation, but it just, I couldn't, I couldn't do anything. So done and over. I was a presidential fellow after I got my master's degree. Um, I was one of, uh, a presidential fellowship, it, it means that every every year the White House gives two graduate students the job of their choice anywhere in the government. And I was uh, one of two from California. Um, and um, that was kind of, so I kind of went, I got the master's and then I had the fellowship and then I was coming back for the PhD. And the, But then it all happened and I got hurt and it was toast. also known as a presidential management internship. It was an internship and then they changed the name to fellowship. Carol said, uh, she was gonna go get a pelvic floor exam, but you canceled because you were having a flare. Should you go or not go if you're having a flare? Go, definitely go. I mean, just tell them you're in a flare, but I mean, seriously, guys, remember, the purpose of a pelvic floor examination is to test, is to study your muscles. They're going to have you walk down the hallway. They're going to see how you walk. They're looking for funky mus muscle tension patterns in your legs, in your hips, in your thighs, in your core, in your lower back, in your upper back. And then they might do it. They're going to do a quick internal exam, vaginal for women, rectal for men. They're just going to touch muscle groups. Remember, your, you, your pelvic floor muscles, you've got three distinct layers of muscles. So they're where your knuckles are. You've got shallow, mid, and deep. And so what they do is they will gently go in and just touch around the shallow ones. Then they will gently touch here. And then they will gently touch here. And if by touching one of those muscles, they trigger your pain, that is a tremendous success because it means they found it. it that's huge. Some patients make the mistake of not going back. And, and don't do that. It's important that you understand that if they can touch a muscle and give you a flare, even for just a, a second, we found it. you got eyeballs on the organ or literally fingers, fingers touching the problem. And just know that when you go back the second time, they're not going to be poking and probbing. What they're going to do instead the second time, if you've got tight muscles. So think about it this way. So let's just say... This is the right side of your pelvic So here's your pelvic floor, right? So this is your pelvic floor. And your pelvic floor, you know, goes from left to right, front to back, low to high. So here's your pelvic floor. So let's just say that on your left side, your muscles are tight. Your right side's pretty good. Your left side's kind of tight. So what they're going to do with their finger is they're just going to come in and they're just going to rub it just very, very gently, right? And their goal is to get the muscle long and pliant again. Now, it gets hard if you've got a trigger point. A trigger point is a little tight bundle of muscle. And sometimes with the trigger point, you know, if you have a knot on your back, what do you do? You push on it. So sometimes they'll push on it, push on the side of it. Sometimes instead of going lengthwise, what they'll do, they'll go this, they'll kind of flicker it this way. But this is why hands-on work is the gold standard. You don't get this level of finesse with, a, you know, with an instrument. It really is a finger in your vagina, gently touching muscles. Now, listen, I know that there are some of you out there who are abuse victims, and, they, and the, the odds of you letting anybody, anybody touch you down there are slim to none. And for you understand that that's okay. It is not your fault. You have done absolutely nothing wrong for you, what they're going to do. And you got to be really honest with them and tell them your fear, tell them your worry. 
and they might just start, they'll work externally with you. But hopefully, once you develop that relationship, good rapport, you see how gentle they are, they can, you know, maybe after three months, four months of really building trust, you will let them go in and just gently touch muscles. You know, I had, so what's so interesting about the pelvic floor, right, is it's the only muscle group that controls major bodily functions because it has to let your bowel movements through, your rectum through, it lets your urethra through, and it lets your reproductive through. Uh, at least for a woman, you have a vagina, right? So that the health of these muscles are going to directly influence your ability to pee and your ability to poop and your ability to have sex. If they are tight, letting stuff out or letting stuff inside like a penis is going to be very painful. If they are loose, you're going to have a prolapse. And on um, here's my my handy dandy demo ball. Okay, so here's your pelvic floor. Here's your bladder properly positioned. Okay, but if your muscles are weak, bam, things start to drop, and then you end up with what we call a prolapse. So either your you, your bladder can start falling through uh, your, your vagina or other, or you just get a prolapse. There comes a point, there comes a point though, when um, if you don't catch it in time and you really let those muscles get stretched out, physical therapy isn't going to work and they might have to do surgery to try to suspend it and get it into right, the right position. Okay. All right, here, hold on a sec. I saw somebody. Kathy, got your email. Thank you, my dear. I will send it out tomorrow, okay? The book will be on its way to you tomorrow. Hey, Marilyn, any thoughts about getting a bidet? Sure. But you know what? This is a hell of a lot cheaper. <laughs> Come on, $2.99, $3.25, whatever it is. Just put one in every bathroom. Oh. Anne Barbiero said she just did have a uterine polyp removed that was spanning the width of your uterus. It flared your bladder and post-surgery, if it had flared your bladder and after surgery, the burning pain was gone. The lead story in the magazine that's going to be coming out next week is uh, is about that. It's about fibroids and uh, and how important it is that we understand that those can compromise bladder function. And when you remove them, things get better. So that's a very, very good news in my book. Sue, your IC started 35 years ago with a horrible IC, IBS flare. So the odds are, Sue, there are two mechanisms of action there. Number one, that you're, I don't know about you, but whenever I have a diarrhea IBS flare, my pelvic floor goes right into spasm. Sometimes they're so violent and they lock down so hard, I can't pee for 30 minutes. And I just have to breathe through it, use my heating pad, drink some water. And eventually I know that those muscles will reduce, will release, and I'll be able to pee again. Um, so that IBS flare may have caused very, very tight pelvic floor muscles for you. And or we've got the shared nerve thing. Carol says, I already blame my son for ruining my figure. Now I blame him for having IC. No, you can't do that. You cannot do that. The greatest gift that a woman can give a man is to risk her life to bear his child. That was something my uh, Jim Johnson, the psych teacher at Montgomery High School, taught us. It's the single one of the most important lessons I learned. The greatest gift a woman can give to a man is to risk her life to bear his child. That's really powerful for me. Um, you know, I don't know, hun. I don't know if that would or not. You won't know until you have your pelvic floor assessment. 
uh, it's far more likely because you say here that you gained 50 pounds while you were pregnant because you'd quit smoking. It's far more likely that your weight gain put pressure on your pelvic floor than a, than delivering a, a four or five pound baby, hun. So I, I think uh, I, hopefully you've you've had an opportunity to lose some of that weight. You know, guys, whenever you carry a big a big belly, as you know, I'm sorry, I didn't have a belly until my hysterectomy. Now I've got a you know an inch inch and a half, maybe even two inch belly here. Ah, I hate it. But whenever you carry weight there, you're putting pressure on your pelvic floor. So losing weight is important. Being in a normal weight range is important. Uh, June asked, do you know of any IC experts in Wisconsin? Just check the database on our website. We have a find an IC doctor website, uh, a database on our website. Hi, Linda. Welcome. We love newbies. I hope that you can see here. There are two messages, three messages I want you to hear from me as a new patient. Number one, you've done nothing wrong. This is not your fault. Number two, there's tremendous diversity in the IC patient population. So you cannot go into Facebook groups and assume that what happened to one person is going to happen to you. There are different variations of IC. There are Hunter's lesions, bladder wall issues, pelvic floor muscle issues, nerve injury issues. And so your number one job is to try to figure out your subtype. And if you come over to our website, the IC network, you can do that. Watch our video, the five subtypes of IC and the six steps of treatment. Regina, Regina, thank you. It's all weird today because it's all humid. And it's very cloudy outside. So I don't like the way I look today. I, I just don't. But it was all curled. It was so cute when I started and it just fell really fast. Yeah, <laughs> Carol, you're funny. She said, Carol says, I tell people my son ruined my figure. I weighed only 105 pounds and I'm still trying to get rid of the baby weight. And they'll ask, well, how old is he? She goes, 31. <laughs> oh God, I heard a really funny joke yesterday. Oh my God. I, I never remember punchlines, darn it. I would love to tell it to you. Uh, Lisa says, how often do you use a V-Magic? Anytime you need to, you just use a little, little tiny bit. And what it does is it provides a protective coating to dry vulva, a dry, a dry urethra, just kind of in there. Use it on the skin. Um, and so it's a mucosal barrier replacement. Uh, you just don't use a lot of it. I mean, I mean, it's, you know, again, this is what it looks like. I mean, so like I would just literally use that amount and you just rub it gently and it's really soothing. I haven't had anybody flare from it, I don't think. Um, I have the world sensitive vulva. My, my uh, OBGYN used to say to me when I was in high school with vulvodynia, he said, you have the most sensitive vulva I have ever seen. And he blamed it on my red hair. And I'm very, very sensitive to chemicals down there and I have no problems with this at all. In fact, I even use it, sometimes my 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 ears itch and, and you know, people use it. It's just, a, it's an organic uh, avocado oil, avocado uh, olive oil. It's olive oil, avocado oil, and sea buckthorn oil. So somebody else in our last meeting said they were using it for another skin condition and they really liked it. See, and it's not sticky. It's It's not, I mean, it's oily. I mean, it's you, you, you definitely can tell it's an oil database. I mean, an oil base, but it's not, I wouldn't, I wouldn't call it sticky. <gasps> Ravonda is asking for prayers in Alabama. They had multiple fatalities due to tornadoes. I hadn't heard that. Everybody send your good thoughts out to Alabama. Wendy is doing the uh, urgent PC nerve stimulation at the ankle and it is helping her. You're sleeping throughout the night. Girl, awesome. That is awesome. And in fact, um, they presented at, um, at the, uh, I think it was uh, the meeting that's just ending is called the Society of Euro Eurodynamics and Female Urology. 
also known as SUFU, and they had their meeting in Chicago the last uh, the last couple of days. Might be ending today, I think. And they presented a paper where they've created a little tiny implant, like the size of a dime, to go right under the skin in the ankle, so that people don't have to use a needle. I'm of the opinion. Why have surgery and put something metal in your body when you can just stick a little acupuncture needle in it? You know, so I don't know. I don't know if I support. It's all about the test results. We don't have the test results yet. But I'm really, really glad that it's helping you. Urgent PC. Becky says her physical therapist use an interferential current electrical stim. Yeah, my physical therapist does too, but only after they do the other work. I will I will lay down for 15 minutes of uh, of heat and tens unit on my lower back, and I love it. It's my favorite part. Carol says, if they find out that you have pelvic floor dysfunction, does that mean that you don't have IC? It, what it means is that you yeah. have, there are a bunch of different names for it. We could call it pelvic pain syndrome. We could call it urologic chronic pelvic pain syndrome. We could call it bladder pain syndrome, or we can call it pelvic floor dysfunction. Don't get, don't, don't worry about the name. Just focus on the problem. You got, if you got tight pelvic floor muscles, that's your, that's your treatment priority is to work on those muscles. Carol said, she was told that you have a prolapse. What should you do? Should you have the hysterectomy? Well, hon, that's only a discussion you can make with your doctor. Uh, I certainly should not be giving you medical advice to have surgery or hysterectomy. I, not only because I'm not your doctor, but number two, I had a hysterectomy uh, 18 months ago, 19 months ago, and, uh, and it's, it's big time surgery. It took me a year to recover. So it needs to be considered very, very, very carefully. Um, that said, if your prolapse is to the point that it is very, very extreme, there is a point when surgery is a must because I mean, think about it this way. Can you walk like this? Can you walk with something hanging out between your legs? Uh, the answer is no. Uh, I have a lovely older lady on who lived in California and she's now in her nineties known her for about 15 years. I think I, I knew her when she was first in her late seventies and she was diagnosed with her prolapse in her seventies and she didn't have the surgery, which was a terrible mistake because now she's 90 and man, and she is like this. I mean, it's really bad and, and she's too old to have the surgery now and she's really, really miserable. So uh, then what they do is they use a pessary Oh, I don't have a demo of it. I'm trying to think if I have a demo of pessary. Sometimes what they will do is they will give you something that you can put in your vagina to push that prolapse back into the proper position. But the pessaries can come. Pessaries are challenging. They're, they're hard. You might be interested to know that a lot of elite athletes, elite runners have completely messed up pelvic floors and they have to compete with pessaries. So, um, you know, you've got to talk with your doctor about how severe it is, would a pessary work, why would you do a hysterectomy as compared to maybe just a regular reconstruction. Uh, you got a lot of questions to, that you need to ask as you consider the pros and cons. There's a website called Hister Sisters, histersisters.com. Please go over to that website. That's a website I went to and I used their support form when I was going through my hysterectomy. Their information is wonderful. Their support form is wonderful. And you might get some really good information over there. So Hister, H-Y-S-T-E-R, Sisters, S-I-S-T-E-R-S.com. Linda says, your, bi your, your biggest problem is bladder pressure what's best to ease that you know pressure is that one kind of vague vague symptom that is hard to understand because pressure can call come from different things um if you feel a false sense of 
fullness. You feel like your bladder is desperately full. And yet when you go pee, nothing comes out. That is that can be a sign that your bladder wall is badly, badly irritated. So let me describe a flare where that happens. So uh, you go to bed at 10. And of course, you peed before you go to bed. You um, wake up an hour later, your bladder feels full, you go to the bathroom, you pee out a quarter cup of urine. You go back to bed, you wake up 30 minutes later, your bladder feels very full, you go to the bathroom, you pee out a tablespoon or a teaspoon. You go back to bed 15 minutes later, your bladder feels full to bursting, you go back to the bathroom, you push and push and you get a drop because literally your bladder's empty. That false sense of fullness is the penultimate symptom that your bladder wall is terribly irritated. And so that would be for me a, if I had had a lot of acid that day, that is, a, I'm trying to remember. So like uh, I wrote a blog, Anatomy of an Utterly Ridiculous Icy Flare that caused this for me. I did this years ago. I had, what did I have in the morning? I had uh, something like scrambled eggs with salsa, mild salsa, but still a little bit of salsa. Then I had a, a, a smoothie with pineapple juice. And then for dinner, I had pasta or something like that. And I was up all night bawling my eyes out. And of course, I didn't know about the diet back then, or we're just getting started with the diet. And that's what a profoundly irritated bladder will do is it will make you feel very full if you're even if you're empty. And so you kind of have to take a step back from the emotion of the pain and the flare and ask yourself, how much water have I really had to drink? If you haven't had a glass of water in the last three hours, yeah, then your bladder probably is pretty empty. And of course, drinking water at that point in time is a good idea because it would be calming and soothing along with having some chamomile herbal tea. Um, but then again, you're going to have to pee that out eventually. So that's number one, pressure. The second thing that we know will trigger sometimes pressure is a fibroid. Uh, I just spent uh, weeks researching fibroids for an article on our website and reading all these journal articles. And... Uh, we also had a new research study that came out uh, a month or two ago, which showed that I see patients with fibroids or with ur urinary patients with fibroids. If we minimize the fibroid, the uh, urinary symptoms, they were cured. They were cured. 65% of patients were cured. And I didn't realize that fibroids could uh, trigger a sensation of bladder pressure. Um, and then you know, tight pelvic floor muscles could potentially do that too. So there you go. Um, heat. I would be using a heating pad. I would be following the diet. I would be, uh, and you're just going to have to play with some of the other things. Guys, we have a 40 page flare management guide that's free. It's free. Just go to our website and there's going to be a pop up window to sign up for our free newsletter. Sign up in your thank you letter. You'll get a link to download our flare management guide. It gives you an hour by hour rescue plan. And, um, and that's the best resource that I have. I need to rewrite it, but we're rewriting and doing our diet one first. So Leslie, what is the best to use if you have IBS instead of Elmeron, sister protect or aloe? Uh, uh, aloe is known for causing gut distress. Aloe is known for triggering diarrhea in some patients. So that probably would not be my first choice. I think trying Sister Protec would be reasonable first because it does not contain aloe. However, whenever you try a supplement, you want to start with one capsule. Make sure your body likes it. If your body handles one, do one a day for a week. Make sure your body likes it. Then you can slowly work your way up two for a week, three for a week, four for a week. Just know that many patients never get that high. For me, when I started Sister Protec, I was fine with one, but I could not take two. When I get when I took two, it gave me loose bowel. I don't like having loose bowel. So when I take Sister Protec, I just take one and it, and it feels good. I feel it. It feels like warm cotton candy in my bladder. It's interesting.
but everybody has different sensations there. So that would be my uh, that would be my inclination with a with a strong IBS patient is to is to be very careful with the aloe first. I think I'd try the Cisto Protect first, but talk with your doctor, see what your doctor would would prefer that you do. Becky, you get a terrible rash from V Magic, really? Okay, she says good idea to do a, a patch test. So you got to be allergic to something in here. You're that's a first for me. Um, I'm really really glad you told me. So V Magic has olive oil. It has avocado oil. It has beeswax, honey. Um, and it has sea buckthorn oil. So you must be intolerant maybe to the sea buckthorn oil. Wow. Good to know. And I'm so sorry that that happened to you, hon. I, that's a, that's a first, but I totally believe you because I know we are freaky sensitive. How can physical therapy help with leaking? I have leaking and I have to wear poised panty liners. Well, you're leaking because your muscles are weak, hun. Okay, so remember, here's your pelvic floor and your pelvic floor controls, your, I mean, it is heavily influencing your ability to pee and poop and have sex. If you're leaking, it's probably because your muscles are weak and they're opening up and they're letting urine through. And so normally what they would do is, is put you on a strengthening routine to try to strengthen those muscles so that you're not leaking. After my hysterectomy, I was leaking more too and, and uh, getting that physical therapy to, and I still have to remind myself, there's a, there's a lady on YouTube. She's a physical therapist in England or Ireland or Scotland. She's hysterical on, um, what's her name? It's a funny name. Like, like bunny or something and she does a comedy show about the pelvic floor um and anyway in one of her she says okay every time you stop at a stop sign do a kegel one kegel um she said that in one of her shows which kind of makes sense but if you've got tight pelvic floor muscles you're not supposed to do a kegel so it's tricky so you need to go to a pelvic floor physical therapist and get a real assessment of your muscles. One might be what tight, one might be weak, one might be low, one might be high. Yeah, you we can't figure it out like this. You can't figure it out. You got to have somebody looking at your muscles to tell you exactly why that's happening. Carol Hansen, what is neuromodulation or electromodulation? Neuromodulation is a step four treatment option uh, in the IC treatment protocol by the AUA. The theory behind it is that some of the nerves in the bladder are not functioning normally. Thus, if you use a mild electronic impulse to retrain them, that it might help reduce some of the symptoms. And it's called uh, interstem is the sacral neuromodulation that involves surgery. Urgent PC is the ankle stem where there is no surgery. Most patients do the ankle stem. I was one of the very first patients in history to receive it. And I think I still have, I don't know if you can see, there's a black mark right there. The, there is a black mark right there. And that's exactly where they stuck the needle. Three finger widths above the top of the, of the ankle bone. And then it's down about a finger width from center. And the needle does not go straight in. The needle goes uh, up and forward to get to the correct nerve. You know you're on the right nerve if your big toe bends down or your toe, little toes flex out. If your toes don't move when they turn it on, they are not near the nerve and it should be done again. And they taught me how to do it. They taught all of, a, all of us early patients, they just gave us tens units and needles and we went home and did it. That was great, I totally freaked out my sister. I, uh, you know, it's so funny with family, they don't really get it. 
like they don't understand what you're what you're going through in any way, shape or form because they don't go with you to the doctor's appointments. And so they didn't really understand what this whole driving to San Francisco, heavy needles put in my legs were until uh, I was in this room. As a matter of fact, when this I had this was not an office, this was a bedroom. And I was laying here and I had done it and I had needles in both ankles and the needles, these are these really long acupuncture needles and it goes, you know, like halfway in. And, and so I had just finished it when she and her husband walked in and they got to see it for the first time. And they were like, oh, okay, that's weird. And I said, well, let me show you how deep it is. And I pulled it out really slowly. <laughs> and when they saw how long it was, they were like, oh, okay, no, that's bad. And it's like, yeah. Okay. The funny story. Cher says she had a hysterectomy a couple years ago. Have you ever had phantom pain with your hysterectomy? If still getting feeling like menstrual cramps? Yeah, 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 I have. Although for me, it's a pulling sensation. It's like there's a fist up my vagina grabbing something and pulling down. And if I sit, if I sit down hard, I will get it. And it it's very uncomfortable and icky and and yuck. Carol says it's not hanging out yet. Hey. <laughs> Yeah, I always look for funny things to put on t-shirts and it's like, I seers do it frequently. <laughs> it's something I've always wanted to put on an IC awareness t-shirt. <laughs> it's not hanging out yet on a t-shirt would be, people would go, what the hell are you talking about? <laughs> would you buy a t-shirt that says, I seers do it frequently? <laughs> That's, I've always wanted to do that. Come up with funny things like that. Regina, has having my hysterectomy made my IC worse? No, it did not. It has absolutely has not made my IC worse. I was, that was, you know, when they told me and I was bawling my eyes out, I, I, I told the doctor, I said, I don't care about the cancer. I, I don't want to go back 20 years uh, and reverse all the progress that I've made with my bladder. And um, luckily, with the new, you know, non, uh, with the new less invasive procedures, you don't hurt your bladder as much. So in my case, it absolutely did not make my IC worse. But what it did do is it messed my pelvic floor up, especially my, especially my levator ani muscle. So I had more rectal pain and I have this pulling sensation, which is my levator muscle spasming. Uh, and no, I don't take any hormones other than a topical estrogen cream. Uh, I, you know, I had another doctor, he wanted to put me back on oral estrogen. And I, and I was like, dude, seriously, I've just been through two years of hell or 18 months of hell going through this uterine thing. I, I don't want to go through that with breast cancer. And he's like, oh, the risk is tiny, yada, yada, yada. You'll feel much better. And then I went to my regular G OBGYN and he and she explained that I was right. She said that there are there's a small group of women who are more prone to uterine and breast cancer. Um, and if there is any chance that I was in my group, taking an oral estrogen would be a, a mistake. And so I made the take the choice not to take it, which is why my face is falling. Oh my God, I've aged 10 years and a year since that surgery. It's ridiculous. Anne says, eating bananas and avocados cause your pelvic pressure. I get it to stop by eliminating eating them. It takes weeks to calm my bladder. Okay, well then those are your risk foods. Uh, for some people, there is a potassium uh, connection, but not for not too many, uh, because actually the big diet studies have found that bananas actually are comforting and soothing to the majority of IC patients who do them. And that, you know, 10 years ago, we thought all bananas were bad, but then we had some really good research that showed that a lot of patients can eat banana. I'm one of them and it doesn't bother them. But in your case, it's definitely bothering you. So you're going to have to pass on those for sure. 
Brenda says, being cold outside makes your bladder hurt. Yeah, because cold is stressful. It is a physical stressor. When you're cold, your pelvic floor muscles get tight. Betsa, I used to have a fibroid, not, uh, but it uh, now it shrunk, but you still have tight pelvic floor muscles. Yeah, so you know what to do. You know what you got to work on. Angela says, getting off my feet and help uh, and heat will help you most with bladder pressure. You've gone through many, many nights with a microwavable heating pad over your bladder. Hey, man, I slept with a heating pad for a decade and I still sleep with a heating. I still have a big heating pad that I sleep with um, frequently. But, you know, I mean, I, I would ask you to think, I, I mean, think about this for a moment here. So. When you get your feet up and you stop moving, you feel better. And moving involves muscles. And I think that that's kind of suggestive that some of your pressure might actually be coming from your muscles. Got to have a sense of humor. All right. So we have been doing this for two hours and 25 minutes. We're just about done. Last call for questions. Last call for questions. If you really appreciate these live support group meetings, please think about becoming a member of the IC Network because that's what helps pay for them. If you are a member of the IC Network, you get our wonderful magazine, The IC Optimist. It is published four times a year with a lot of comprehensive information um, that we don't put on our website for at least six months. In this last one, we have a detailed article on the Elmeron macular, uh, pigmentary maculopathy, as well as an interview with Dr. Angie Storr the author of the book, When It Hurts Down There. You can be a member for just $25 and you will get it all by email. As You'll get eight total issues, four back issues and four future issues. For $50 a year, we will mail them to you and you will have access to two years worth of back issues and our diet guide and our flare guide and a whole bunch of other stuff. And then we even have a bigger subscription for people who want five years worth of magazines. We can do that for you. So you can sign up to become a member right on our website. Just go into our shop and uh, you, you're helping us help you. And that's important. Uh, you know, got bills to pay. Got to say. All righty. Last call for questions. Last call for questions. What is the Cisto Protect that I'm talking about? Let me show you. So um, supplements have been um, supplements have been around for years, and these were created by IC researchers. Cisto Protec. was invented by IC researcher, Dr. Theo Harris, Theo, Theo Harides, who uh, is a federally funded IC researcher who is uh, at Tufts University. Dr. Theo, as we call him, is a, an adorable geek. He is the scientist scientist. And um, as part of his work uh, teaching at the medical school at Tufts, uh, he's a pharmacologist, which is my first degree. He's also in pharmacology. The state of Massachusetts asked him to investigate the safety and effectiveness of supplements like 20 years ago, 25 years ago. And as he was doing that work, because he was also doing IC studies at the time, he, you know, an idea popped in his head. Can I make a supplement that would be helpful for somebody with IC? And he decided to give it a try. And so he created a company called Algonaut. And he's Greek. All go not means no pain in Greek. 
And his first supplement was called Algonaut. Um, and then uh, within a year or two, he changed the formula and created Cisto Protec. And Cisto Protec has uh, two meth methods of action. It has a bladder coating effect through chondroitin and sodium hyaluronate. Those are um, those are actually IC treatments in Europe and Canada. They're not FDA approved in the United States as bladder installations, but they are in Canada. So this is them in an oral form combined with quercetin. Quercetin has a antihistaminic effect. And so when Cisto Protec came out, and of course, because he's a scientist, a major IC researcher, he did a very large study of I think 252 patients who took it six months uh, before he even released it to the public. And this has been the top supplement in the IC world now for 15 plus years since it came out. Um, we sell it in our store. It, the supplements are becoming all the more important now that Elmeron has gotten so expensive. Many patients simply cannot afford Elmeron. So it's kind of like a natural Elmeron, similar effect. Um, but even more so now, now that Elmeron has been associated with some pretty severe eye damage, patients are flocking to supplements and the American Urology Association supports the use of supplements. They list them as a step one treatment option in their treatment guideline because they have fewer side effects than Elmeron. So many patients when they're diagnosed with IC are given the diet, they're given a supplement, they say, all right, come back in three months and let's see how you do. And that's perfectly reasonable. Um, the next supplement is Cisto Renew. So this is an old formula, if you're 15 plus years old, we've learned a lot about IC since then. We've been waiting for Dr. Theo to create his next generation supplement, but he's moved on, he's working with autism now. So a new doctor, Dr. Gio Espinosa, who actually came to our last support group meeting, he's a real celebrity, he's a lovely man. He's a director of integrative urology at New York University. He created the Next Generation Supplement. And it's basically the same ingredients as this, but with the addition of a little bit of aloe and a little bit of a mint called lemon balm. It's not citrus lemon. It's a mint with a lemony scent that is known for calming nerves down. And so many former Cisto Protec users have moved to Cisto Renew because they feel like it's a better formula. However, quite a few still prefer Cisto Protec. Um, and of course we do have Desert Harvest Aloe. For, there are lots of patients who just love aloe by itself. And so uh, this is the only company that did a double blind placebo controlled study with IC in their product, and they're doing another one this year. And then we have a new supplement coming out that I've been helping with, with another company that is currently being tested by a couple of uh, a top doctors that um, is looking at the biome. So very similar to these, but adding a couple of more ingredients to get help a to support a healthy biome. So hopefully that will be available in March. We keep it's been reformulated several times, um, not for bad reasons. It's just trying to attack IC in a different way and trying to attack bladder pain in a different way. So now we've finally agreed on a formula. They're already testing it on patients, including patients who are considered end stage. Those patients, uh, at least one that I know of, is, loves it, is doing well. And then we've got one of the biggest IC doctors in the world behind it, and he's testing it in his clinic. So um, I hope to have a new supplement for you that will be the real next generation supplement. And it's very, very exciting. JJ, thanks for becoming a member. So much appreciated. Uh, Angela says that she's using Intrarosa for vaginal atrophy, which is non-estrogen and it's working. Awesome. I got to write that down. Hold on. Also, one of the big stories that I'm doing in our magazine is on hyperbaric oxygen therapy for IC. Now that it's available in the U.S., um, it is doing incredibly well for patients with Hunter's lesions. We've got the research to back it up. And if you don't know, I had to share the absolutely terrible news 
uh, last week that Lyris has been deactivated. The first treatment in history to heal Hunter's lesions, the company Allergan has deprioritized the research and it is dead in the water and it is infuriating. So uh, hyperbaric oxygen also is healing Hunter's lesions uh, in some patients. And so that might be an option to consider. I should have said that earlier when we we're talking about lesions. Cheryl says she had one physical therapy appointment for your pelvic floor dysfunction. It helps so much. Can't wait to go back. Awesome. Love to hear it. JJ said, is Sister Renew as good as Sister Protect? I think Sister Renew is better than Sister Protect. Uh, Benjamin, the name of the doctor I mentioned at New York University is Dr. Gio Espinosa. And he has a website, drgeo.com. Sign up for his newsletter. It's one of the better urology uh, newsletters for patients. I get it. Uh, Director of Integrative Urology at New York, New York University. Callista, thank you for help. Uh, you're uh, very welcome. I'm more than happy to try to help. I'm so sorry that you're crying in pain and that you can't find relief. Remember that this is when we go back and we revisit the diagnosis. That's what the American Urology Association says. So we wanna take a step back for a moment from the treatments that you're doing and let's take a look and, and ask ourselves, well, is it really the bladder? Could it be the pelvic floor? Could it be untreated lesions? Could it be estrogen atrophy? You are an anatomical mystery to be solved. I always say to patients, listen, I don't want you to go to walk into a doctor's office and say you have IC. I use, you're going to drop down the rabbit hole of rabbit hole of poor information potentially and, and potentially poor opinions. I want you to walk in very specifically and say, doctor, I have this symptom. Can you please help me understand what in my pelvis can trigger this symptom? Don't even say interstitial cystitis. Now, like Donna, who was in here earlier, who was participating from her hospital bed, that that's one of the key points that she had to do because they thought she had IC, but a doctor was actually able to determine that she had bilateral nerve entrapments instead. So we've got to understand your anatomy first. And it's Espinosa with two S's, no Z. Tammy, can you take Desert Harvest Aloe with Sister Renew? Um, uh, I'm sure the companies would love for you to do that because you're giving them money. On the other hand, I come from a less is more perspective. Uh, yeah. I don't believe in adding more. I like I like using less, to be quite honest. And so if it were me, I would start with one, work your way up, and then add the other. I would actually start with Assistant Renew, see how you feel with Assistant Renew, and then maybe add a little bit of aloe to that. Okay? Just, you know, don't. And guys, don't take the maximum dose first. You're going to shock your body. Start with little tiny bits and see how you feel. Holly, why are so many doctors not knowledgeable about IC, specifically urologists? Well, number one, you know, you have to understand that some doctors are in urology because they love to do surgery. And urologists in general do a lot of surgery. They do a lot of prostate surgery, stuff like that. It can be very adrenaline filled and fun for them. Um, and and there uh, many, many doctors don't like to work with chronic conditions. They're not as interested in chronic conditions as they are interested in something like prostate cancer or bladder cancer. I was working with a patient a couple months ago who had urethral cancer. She was 34 years old. She had to have her urethra removed, her bladder removed, and a full hysterectomy all because of an HPV virus, a viral infection from HPV, the human papillomavirus. And so there are some doctors who just live for the surgery. That is what excites them. Uh, finding doctors who like to work with chronic conditions or pain or who are sympathetic and understanding is, is harder. You know, you have to remember that doctors, then number one, they diagnose by visually they 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 have to look at you they've got to look at tissue and when you can't see i see it creates doubt in their mind but you also have to remember that that your definition of pain may mean nothing to them you know doctors 
use their own personal pain experience as reference. Well, what if they've never had bladder pain? What if they've never had a UTI? They, what if they've never had IC? What if they've never had radiation? What if they've never had this? They simply do not understand the severity of the pain that the bladder can cause. There's only one doctor that I know of who is willing to try to experience it, and that was Dr. Chris Payne, who um, uh, had a very caustic substance put into his bladder. He did, and he lasted just a minute or so before it came out because it was so, so painful. And that is one of the reasons why he is so incredibly sympathetic to women and men with pain because he knows what it's like. So if your doctor's never had pain, bam, they might not get it. And also, too, the the classes are really only at the national conferences and most doctors cannot afford to go to the national conferences. They can go to one or two a year and, and usually that's not the national AUA. So, you know, uh, we have a list of doctors on our website who are more interested. You can use that database. Kathy says she's been taking alfalfa tabs for two months and you think it's helping. Good. I don't know anything about alfalfa. I don't, I don't understand why that would help, but if it's helping you and it's as long as it's organic and not contaminated with pesticides, power to you. Cynthia's asking, has anybody taken Euro MP? Euro MP. What is that? Let me look at that. Oh, methylene blue. Um, you know, it's kind of like the old uracet. I mean, it's methenamine, hyosamine with a little bit of aspirin. It's just one of many variations of Euro blue and stuff like that. Uracet, uh, Eurobel. They they're all in the same class of family. I mean, the assumption here is that. It, there's a, it's got methenamine and methylene blue, which, which acts as an antiseptic. It might kill some bacteria. Uh, it's got a little bit of aspirin in it for pain management. It's got a little bit of hyosamine to help you urinate. It's not an IC treatment. It's not listed in the IC treatment protocol. Kathy came home from a 10 day cruise, no flares. Awesome. You know, it's amazing how sometimes changing your environment, changing your stress, changing your environmental exposures, changing your food exposures can do amazing things for your health. I've had many patients report that when they go away on vacation, they feel better. And that to me helps us to understand that we've got to look at their home and their daily life to see if there's something in their daily life which is triggering, triggering their symptoms, a bad habit, an old habit chemicals in your home, Febreze, scented candles, things like that, which might be triggering more inflammation in your body. Sharon says, would the supplements uh, help keep Hunter's ulcers from returning? No, no. Uh, what they would do though is provide some protection and they would reduce some inflammation potentially. So if you, if you, um, I don't think anybody can say that. We don't have a supplement that would make that would prevent a lesion for an ulcer from returning. Alana, we have Canadian doctors in our database on our website. They're a little few and far between, but we've got some. And one of the best researchers in the world is Dr. Curtis Nickel at Queen's University in Kingston, Ontario. Um, and his clinic right now is the top uh, IC clinic in the country. Uh, he is not taking new patients unless, unless you participate in a clinical trial. One of the sneaky ways to get into some doctor's offices that are not open for new patients is to look at their clinical trial program first. Um, because if they're doing a clinical trial that you can participate in, you get free medical care and cutting edge therapy. And it was Dr. Curtis Nichol who did the early Lyris studies and saw Hunter's lesions heal. Cynthia, is taking your MP harmful? Uh, I, you'll have to look at the, you have to read the patient reports. Usually medications like that are kind of meant to be used as needed. They're usually not meant to be taken over the long term. Uh, they're usually meant to be taken on an as needed basis. All right, my friends, listen, 
It was wonderful talking with you today. Um, and I want you to remember that the IC Network is here to help. If there's anything that we can do to help you, please don't hesitate to ask. Uh, you can call us 1-800-928-7496. If you go to our website, go to our contact page, you can send me a personal email. Um, and or you already have my personal email for those of you. If you want a freebie, if you would like a free microwavable heating pad, which is our freebie for today, you need to send your name and address to icnetwork at macmac.com. And I would be more than happy to send you a, a body heat sample so that you can give that a try. All right. Now, listen. I always end these meetings with a very, very important message. And that is, if there's one thing I want you to remember from this meeting is that this is not your fault. You have done absolutely nothing wrong. There is no shame, no blame to be held here. You are no different than someone who is hit by a car. And you deserve the love and support of your family. Just like if you had a family member who had a broken leg. You know, that's the irony here. That, you know, when you, especially for, Things like this that are kind of hidden and kind of embarrassing. We tend to hide it from people. We don't want to talk about it. And yet, ironically, if you had a family member with prostate cancer, you would take them to the hospital. You would sit out that you would sit beside them at the bed. You would be there for the surgery. You would bring them home. You would love on them at every single moment. You would fix them their favorite foods. You would tell them how much you love them and how much you support them. And yet, why is it that we patients don't think that we deserve exactly the same thing, right? I mean, it's really fascinating here. So please don't hide it from your family. If you need support, ask for support. Remember that they cannot read your mind. If you need a hug, ask for a hug. All right? Now, listen, I need you to do three things every day to support your healing. Number one, I want you to do 15 minutes a day for something that will nourish your spirit. I don't care what it is. You can go to church. You can go hug a redwood. You can go sit in the sun. Do something that brings you comfort. Secondly, for 15 minutes. Secondly, I want you to do something for 15 minutes that will support your pelvis and your bladder, whether it is driving by Starbucks instead of stopping or, um, and you guys, uh, you're, you're not getting a microwavable heating pack. You're getting a one-time heat pack. Just so you know, this is not a microwavable heating pad. This is a heating pad that you literally peel the back off and put it on your underwear. All righty. Somebody just said microwavable in my email. It's not. Okay. Getting back to this. Make a good decision for your body for 15 minutes. Take a warm bath. Use a heating pad. Take a walk. Something that will help your pelvic floor. Pass on a food that you shouldn't do. Make a food that you know is going to be bladder friendly. And then last but not least, I need you to do 15 minutes to work on your brain and your intelligence level. You know, it's going to be very hard for anybody to tell me I sees on my head. I will slam dunk them with research. You know, I have done my due diligence for 25 years. I read almost every IC research study. Nobody could ever out argue me that IC is all in my head. I can prove them wrong. And I want you to be able to do the same thing. Uh, but it begins with knowledge, hon. You got to start reading stuff. And that's not reading Facebook and social networking, which is the pit of the IC movement in many ways because of the bad information that comes out. Would you seriously just come on over to our website, the IC Network, and read a blog? or Go to the National Library of Medicine, pubmed.gov, and Google it, and search for interstitial cystitis and read a research study. Read something. Let's get your knowledge level up there. All right, hon? If you find something really interesting that you think I'd miss, would you send it to me? Because we are a team working together. It's just like IC Awareness Month. IC Awareness Month is not about me talking about IC. It's about all of us talking about IC. We got to work together, my friends. We have to work together. All righty then. Oh, thank you. Um, Elise on YouTube says, I just want to say that your channel is the place I go to when I need to be reminded that there is hope that I will get better. I've had terrible pain every day for 18 months now. So Elise, seriously? Oh, and you're from Norway. I have relatives in Drammen. I have relatives in Drummond and I have a whole half of our family. We didn't even, we hadn't even found this family until we went to ancestry.com. It turned out my great grandmother had a second family. We didn't, none of us knew about my, 
my dad has um, a whole bunch of aunts and uncles who none of us knew about. And they're all in Norway and Sweden right now. So we're communicating. I would love to get over there at some point in time. But anyway, Elise, if you want to talk, you know, go ahead and uh, send me an email. You guys, I also do coaching and I do it in every country. I have been known to be up at one or two in the morning, my time to work with somebody in another time zone. So if you really would like to spend some time, if you've got Skype, I can work with you over video. You can come on over to the IC network and go into our shop and sign up for that. Um, if you would like to do that, uh, if it's for one or two in the morning for me, I'm going to charge for that because that's, I'm working hard to, to do that and to stay awake for that. All right. But anyway, all right, my friends, I wish you well. And thank you for people on Facebook earlier who shut down that person. I have no idea who she was or what that issue was, but whatever she was saying could, could not have been farther from the truth. This person came in on Facebook and said that I was required pain patients to be drug tested. I don't know where the hell she got that. I chaired the state of California pain conference that led to our governor signing the pain patient bill of rights. That would be the last thing I would ever say. So, so thank you for the people on Facebook who helped shut that down. Alrighty. Okay, my friends, I will see you later. Have a good one. I'm going to shut down YouTube first. Goodbye, YouTube.